Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which usually is um, a conversation with my friends. And today, of course, we have got, as always, Landon with us. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. I've missed everybody so much. I feel like it has been forever since we've had a stream, even though it's only been like two weeks. Yeah, and we didn't stream at all last week. We ended up canceling it because of everything that was going on with, with both of us. But we're back this week, and we're finally getting to our um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban that we kept promising you guys. I know we kept pushing it back. It was supposed to be, like, the first stream this month. Well, well, we're finally having it. We're having it now. <laughs> oh, bless you. Mercury is in retro was in retrograde for most of the month of, uh, of October. We should have assumed that nothing was going to get done this week. Is that what we're blaming it on? Is that officially what we're saying the problem is? Isn't that what we, I mean, we could say that it's a no bones day, but I'm not sure how mm. much of our graphic would get that. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, that's the popular meme right now. We just, we had a no bones month. We had a no had bones a no month, guys. Bones month. <laughs> <laughs> our bones had to be used in other places. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Unfortunately, stream didn't get prioritized. Um, but yeah, Landon, uh, so what is it, what is it that we're going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which is my favorite book and favorite, or second favorite book, favorite movie of the series. Mm, so I definitely a good movie. For hours. Yes. So I think this stream is going to be a little bit different than what you guys have come to expect from our other two Harry Potter streams, because um, we actually like this book. Like, genuinely, I think both of us genuinely, truly like this book. We don't just like parts of it or the idea of it. Like, we genuinely, we really love this book. <laughs> so, uh, Not only different. do we genuinely love this book, but this book is actually really well written. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that's, truly. that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, however, there are, of course, still problematic parts of it and still things that we want to discuss uh but i think overall as the fandom the fandom pretty much agrees that this book rocks oh absolutely and i mean there's no such thing as a as a perfect a perf perfect book when especially when you're talking about a franchise that has so many different elements to it but um this one's pretty darn close isn't it it is okay yeah. so first things first should we talk about uh the disclaimers we got Yep. So you'll you'll see those these up on the screen throughout the um throughout the stream. You'll see them at the bottom next to our cameras. There's one one on this side and one on this side. But um, we just want to be to be clear. Uh, and this is true for all of our media analysis episodes. We do not do spoiler free, and and we don't just mean that is in this book. Uh, it is impossible for Landon and I to to go back and make sure we're not sharing spoilers from future books or ex the extended wizarding world, as as they might WB might call it. Um, you know, so it just kind of uh, there's going to be spoilers. So if you are not super familiar with Harry Potter and you want it to stay that way, this is not the stream for you. I will see you guys next week. <laughs> yes, or or go watch Harry Potter, or read Harry Potter right now, and then come back and watch the vod that's posted mm -hmm. on YouTube. Yeah, uh, that's fine the too. Whole, I think the whole point of this uh, media look back from a franchise that was popular today, obviously, but was very much in the height of its time 12 years ago, uh, is to enjoy the fact that we know everything that has happened since then mm -hmm. and to look at it through that perspective. Yes. So we won't be excluding anything. Yep. Uh, and on top of that, there will be discussion of dynamics, um, topics of dynamics involving past and continual abuse, because that's Harry's storyline, as well as the discussion of AIDS and any other anti-LGBTQ rhetoric that happens within the books that is the large chunk of the problematic aspect of this book is has to do with anti-LGBTQ uh, LGBT, rhetoric. Yes, yes. So it, we've these the books. Uh, um, every single book is about child abuse. I mean, we've we've covered that in previous episodes. But uh, but this one also gets into the AIDS crisis. We will we will talk about that. So if you're if you're ready for some um, Lupin uh, werewolf hot takes, this is the episode. <laughs> so it's happening. It hey, is. Lunar, welcome, welcome. So happy you got first today. Are you ready to talk some Harry Potter? I'm ready to talk some Harry Potter. So yeah, if you guys. <gasps> And by the way, this is Landon's new friend. She got a new um, little kitty cat. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I we're not sharing traditional favorite things, so I can't share the baby. Oh my uh, god! But I I should, I, I'd share the baby as we talk about this terrible, terrible thing. <laughs> yeah. So, Landon, what's the baby's name? Tell everybody the baby's name. This is Merlin, <gasps> and he's named Merlin 
funny because he's got white, uh, he's got a black face, but he has white eyebrows and white whiskers, which makes him look like he has a beard. Uh, so he's so an he's old funny. man already. <laughs> he's, he's Benjamin Buttoning is what I'm saying. Oh, that's um, so cute. But I got him a few weeks ago. Uh, that's been one of the big things that we've missed since, since the last stream. Um, and he's, he's fitting in right really well. So the, uh, Landon's household is now officially a three cat household. I am at my cat lady maximum. <laughs> they, so... they multiply like that. It's like you get a cat and then you get another cat because you want to have a friend and then you get a third cat because why not? It's not that much hard to take care of three cats compared to two. <laughs> <laughs> I, figured, I figured at this point, Draco is 13 years old and no longer wants to play with Sherlock. Mm -hmm. So I need to get Sherlock a kitten to play with. There you go. That was my, that was my reasoning. What so, a good excuse. I love it. <laughs> you see a little if you see a little kitten meowing back here in the corner that's that's merlin so mm -hmm. um, all right yeah. so yeah guys um be warned of all that content for this episode um and, and you know we're just we're, we're gonna get into that so just be aware if that's not your cup of tea again no problem see you next week yep um also we want to take this moment to make it clear that we do not agree with joanne rowling's abhorrent statements against the trans community um, and here at Enter Stage Window, we encourage, encourage uh, you to donate to nonprofits that support trans youth. And the Trevor Project is one of the largest ones. And they, uh, they don't only do transgender youth, but they do all of LGBTQ youth in general. Mm -hmm. So yep. Uh, yep. if you were going to donate to today's stream, uh, we encourage you to, do to donate to the Trevor Project instead. Yes, absolutely. All right, that's all the disclaimers out of the way. Um, let's actually get into some of the content. So we're going to start with favorite things. And um, I wanted to start off today's favorite things with Landon's favorite thing. So Landon, if you could go first for us today, reveal for us, what is your favorite thing from this particular Harry Potter book? Listen, I am a simple, simple, simple girl, which means like every other simple girl, I fell in love with the Marauders. Uh, and it is a big thing in the fandom to, to, for especially fiction and art to exist with the Marauders. Um, but we discover the, the Marauders and then their counterparts like Lily, like Lily Potter. And we discover more about them and their friendship and the dynamics and who they were in school. Uh, and that's all so fun for a aspiring writer to want to dig into. So that is mm -hmm. my favorite um and also just like strong friendships that have been torn apart because of tragedy for the win <laughs> i think you know as far as like all of the various tragic characters in harry potter i have to say peter is one that i feel incredibly drawn to and i always have i've always thought that he was just he had the most fascinating story he had the most fascinating characterization um, and I'm really excited. So for you guys to know now, not next week, because next week we're doing our Halloween community day, but the week after that, we're going to actually have an episode where we talk all about the Marauders. So I'm really excited to share with you guys some of my um, Peter Pettigrew takes, because I have a few. Um, so if you're interested in that, please come back week after next, and we will be sharing all of that with you. And and the other thing about the Marauders, just to add to what Landon says, um, Landon and I would not be friends without the Marauder. So even though we met in a once upon a time role play, um, and that's where we, we, we were introduced to each other, where we actually became friends was, um, was in a Marauders role play where we shared head cannons about, um, Marauders, uh, about the Marauders themselves, as well as the, the Death Eaters that were, um, during the Marauders era, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and those, those groups and how those interacted and, and what we thought would be a cool version of a prequel to Harry Potter. So we would not be friends today if it were not for the Marauders. Nope, we would not, which is also another reason why it's a very special place in my heart. But also, mm -hmm. I could talk about Jimmy P or James Potter for hours. I have. <laughs> I have, in fact, talked about James Potter for and hours. And at this point... Do it again! <laughs> and at this point, your version of James is uh, is to my preferred version of James. <laughs> canon <the> canon version! <laughs> <laughs> canon is, I mean, is whatever. Who cares? To me... Landon's version of James Potter is the version of James Potter that exists in my heart and in my mind. <laughs> we'll get to hear all somewhat about it. We'll stick to we'll stick to canon a little bit, but we will do, dive into fandom, fandom, and fanon because that is the episode that we'll be doing for the Marauders. Yep. So, 
come come join us in two weeks for that it'll be a lot of fun like i said we both have a lot of love we've spent a lot of years in that fandom uh i'm still in it so come yeah. forth come listen to the point that sometimes I forget what pieces are canon and which pieces I've just been writing for so long that I, I think they're canon. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're all canon. Canon yeah, is true. canon at this point. That's what I believe. Yeah. But are you are you saying that it's not canon that James Potter doesn't cry to Queen songs? Come I on mean, now. Death of the author <laughs> is totally a thing, and I am absolutely here for it when it comes to minor characters like the Marauders. So who's to say? <laughs> all right. Karen, what is your favorite thing? All right, so before I say my favorite thing, I just want to say welcome in, Jane. Jane, I see that exclamation kitty right there. Um, I'm going to assume that's directed at, at Merlin and what uh, Lando was saying about Merlin. And uh, and I, I, I agree. I'm disturbed, excited, heartsick, and here for it. That's how I feel when I look at that kitty cat. Because you all know I'm, in a, I'm not at home right now. I'm at my parents' house, so I'm missing my kitty cats. So it was very appropriate exclamation kitty use there, Jane. Okay, my actual, my actual favorite thing from this book is the Patronus charm. So I know that this screenshot is from a, a later um, installment, but I think it's just the most beautiful shot of a Patronus from the movie. So that's why we are including this, even though it's not the shot of the Patronus from the actual like third book slash third movie. But I am, you know, like Landon said, I am also a simple bitch. And anytime you give me any kind of like animal companion, animal shape-shifting animal spirit thing like i'm just gonna be like ooh, ooh, what's that what would mine be oh what would my patronus be oh i need to know how i would cast a patronus oh my god what if my patronus changed over time based on my relationships and you know i can just go on forever right i can just go on forever on that on that train of thought and um it's still something to this day that when i am creating a new character an oc or, um, or I'm picking up a new uh, canon to play in, in a fandom role play, I'll think about like, ooh, if they were in the Harry Potter world, what would their Patronus be? Like it is still something that I, I do, even though I'm not actively role playing um, or, or doing any kind of fandom stuff in, uh, in Harry Potter specifically um, for, you know, JK Rowling reasons, as we know. But um, <laughs> I still what? am very attached. I still am very attached to the concept of a Patronus. What <laughs> is your Patronus? So when I actually took the the test, I got one, whatever the bird of prey was, it was like a falcon or an osprey or something like that, which I really, I really very much enjoyed. Um, but the thing that I really love about the Patronus charm, and this is part canon, part head canon, so bear with me a moment, but um, it, because it's based on your fond memories, right? Like it's based on what your happy memories are, and, and that's how you summon it, that's how uh, you give it form and function, right? The Patronus, as we know, can change. Uh, Snape's Patronus is depicted in canon as a doe because of his um, obsession and deep friendship with Lily, right? And it's implied in the text that at some point, uh, Severus's Patronus was not that. Maybe like, you know, at first it wasn't that, or maybe, you know, in the time that um, that he was a professor before Harry came to the school, it's possible that um, that his Patronus wasn't, wasn't that, but it went back to a doe once he got to know Harry again. Some of the lines imply stuff like that. We don't know what else his Patronus might have been, but the lines imply that. And then we also have the situation where Tonks' Patronus changes into a wolf when she starts having strong feelings and fears that Remus um, does not love her back, right? She starts to worry like, oh, he's, you know, he thinks he's too old for me. He doesn't care about me the way I care about him, da 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 And she's having a lot of turmoil about that. And um, so her Patronus changes into a wolf. And, um, and, I, and I love this concept of like, it's, it's born of your, of your happy memories. And so if you're having, if you're going through strong emotions, then um, the form of your Patronus can change. So that's something that, that I also just really love about the Patronus charm. Uh, it's, it's not just what your Patronus is now. It is also indicative of what is making you happy in that moment or what, what, your, what memories you're using in that moment to summon the Patronus. I love that. That is something that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, unfortunately, like it, in the books, it's said that it's like rare for Patronuses to change. Um, but I like the headcanon that, yeah, it changes with what brings you joy. Yeah, well, the way it says it's rare, but then the two examples that we have, those are things that could happen to anybody and yeah. do happen to lots of people. So when we're, so they say it's rare, but then you're given the examples and it's like based on those examples, it is not everybody rare. Felt, everybody <laughs> saw 
fall in love. Like anyone yeah. can fall in love and and be afraid that the person doesn't love them back and that right. can affect them. Right. Every sense. everybody forms these these deep connections with with people that are sometimes imbalanced. You know, whether whether that's by their own design or just from the fact of, you know, you can't make another person love you. Um, this is this is a human thing that happens to all of us at one point or another in our lives. So to me, it is not rare. I think Patronuses change and it is normal. Maybe it, they, they think it's rare because the Patronus charm isn't used very often, but that's my thoughts on that. Uh, thank you so much for the applause, um, Monica. Uh, Monica found my stream on Thursday when we did the first part of, uh, of my blind stream of Doki Doki Literature Club. And, um, and so, Monica, you don't know this, but now uh, Landon can live another week by your applause. <laughs> I am secretly Tinkerbell. I need applause to live. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your donation has is appreciated <laughs> <laughs> yes so that's my favorite thing i love patronuses i love how they're introduced i love the scene where harry is learning about them from lupin um i love the lore of of how they change they're just i, I find them fascinating and uh, it's one of the p things in harry potter that makes me not be able to just fully let it go the one the one thing is that makes me so sad about patronuses is just like it, it's in reference to harry where it's like Harry tr struggling so hard to find a happy memory. And I'm just like, ah, once again, we have an abused boy who has no happiness in his life. Tragic. But he has to think of the concept of having parents to yeah. bring a happy memory. Yeah, and if you anyway. follow the lore, if you follow the lore, well, then obviously Harry's Patronus must be a stag because if his only happy memory is this is the imagination of potentially that he could have had parents, well, then it must be a stag. It can be anything else. Which is also, and this is a debate that might belong on a different stream at some point, but which is also why I have this huge belief that your Patronus is not your Animagi. Mm -mm. Uh, and the idea does that not have to be. So like, it, it is. And I'm like, no, it's not. Absolutely not. Because if I was an Animagi, I can tell you exactly what my form would be. I would be a house cat. I'd be a little kitty cat. That's just how that is. <laughs> I <love you. laughs> But Patronus, right. I'm not as confident. Shall we talk about the effects that ha that the Prisoner of Azkaban had? Yes. Okay. So All let's right. get into it, guys. You know, we like to, to kind of go into a little bit of, of the, the history and the structure, and that's kind of what we, we love to get started with before we talk about some of the themes itself. So, um, so yeah, Landon, Landon, take us away. Tell us a little bit about how this book is different than the other two. So this book is the, bir the true birth of YA. Uh, or, or YA like, as or we what, know it today. Or what would be YA as we know it today. Of course, there were yes. books that could be considered YA prior to this. But this is truly the child, like we are leaving the children's literature uh, left, or the children's literature formula is being left behind. And we are coming in to a new formula, a new style of writing that really is bridging the gap between children's literature. So it's happening to a child but it's more representation of adult fiction that is happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, as a, as a refresher, children's literature, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, really focused highly on the children's mystery novel. Being able to sell multiple, have ghostwriters write several different books so that you constantly had a new book. And, and Harry Potter had started breaking that from the very beginning, but it still had the roots in a mystery. And there are still hints of a mystery here. However, the mystery is more recognized as uh, as a overall plot mystery rather than a device to set the the story continue to go. Like, right. Because like the mystery so. in this one is who is Sirius Black? What is he about? But this isn't something that like Harry actively goes out and tries to discover the way that he tries to solve the mysteries in the first two books. It's something that that we discover naturally through the course of what happens to Harry and his natural connection to Sirius. Exactly. Uh, and it's not all consuming for him. Like he definitely thinks about Sirius Black is the fact that he's trying to kill him. Uh, but he, it's not every moment is not dedicated to solving that mystery of like why we're told right off the bat why it's mm -hmm. because Sirius Black is a follower of the Dark Lord and is angry that Harry killed Voldemort mm -hmm. um so it, it really is we're playing we're playing with a completely different genre and it's noticeable and it also makes the story more exciting um the scenes of the actual physical book the scenes are getting longer the dialogue is more intense. The character, like into inner thoughts, uh, is growing larger. Like there are more, there are less 
scenes that actually say more Mm -hmm. than the previous two novels. And you know Uh, what? In this novel, the characters get to just talk to each other. They get to just hang out. And that doesn't happen in the first two books at all. No, um, and it was like this whole thing that they they didn't just hang out because there was this constant, because every single thing that happens in a novel needs to move the story forward, right? But the goal was to solve a mystery in the previous two. In this book, it's the goal is to tell a story, which means that every single scene is important and is doing something. So we have this like scene of, of Ron and Harry and Hermione all hanging out and we're hearing Ron and Hermione fight well, it's just a scene of them all hanging out, but really what's that doing is it's setting up the scene for the fact that they're going to, ha- that Ron and Hermione are going to fight throughout the entire book. And then that's going to be a major plot point. Mm-hmm. So it really is on a writer's scale, setting up a plot better than having to do a follow an exact formula. Mm-hmm. Like the, I, there is still the skeleton of what children's literature is and what plot and what is in like plot devices however it is it is just a skeleton instead of the whole body yes yes Kay, that's so funny that you say that um you should definitely go back and and read it because uh the this is where that starts to get good <laughs> yeah. um the the prisoner of azkaban is the first book that i would say is is truly well written and it's what hooked me into the series it's what really got me like i read the first two because everybody was talking about them and they were popular and stuff but i didn't fall in love with it until this book this is when i truly like fell in love with harry potter and was like i need more of this world yes and don't get me wrong it is it can be confusing especially i think this is where this is where again the shift is happening so we're losing the younger we're using we're losing elementary grades so we're losing grades three through five, three through six. Yeah. So we this is like books. middle grade minimum. You and need sixth grade into, minimum. Yeah, we're coming into <laughs> yeah. the more middle grade young adults, which is more directed towards the 13 and 13 through 18 year olds, yeah. Uh, yeah. which is which is when, when people talk about they grew up with Harry Potter or Harry grew up with them. There is a phenomenon that is absolutely true because as you follow the books, the genre does grow up. Mm-hmm. It changes. It shifts from children literature that is directed towards those elementary to early middle school years with people who can connect in the middle grades to actually focusing on middle grade readers, at the same age of Harry, to young adult readers, to almost new adults. There are some new adult mm-hmm. sh- themes that come into in the, the last book. book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although it's a it, new adult wasn't even a con, it wasn't even a concept back then. Well, but- you know, and and we talked about this. If you if you guys go back and watch our our first uh, Harry Potter stream on the first book, we talk about this. Young adult was not a thing when I was coming along, except for Harry Potter. After you grew out of mid- so called middle grade fiction like Babysitters Club, Animorphs, Goosebumps, things like that, you went to adult literature. I mean, you read like ni- like nineteen eighty four. You read um, Isaac Asimov if you liked sci fi. You read Stephen King if you liked horror. You know, like that's and there was, that's what you and read. There was a couple that were considered YA literature, Catch but not really. Lie, they weren't. To yeah. Kill a Mockingbird being those where it's an easier read for kids and young adults to grasp, but it really is fiction that is talking on a bigger picture it is yeah yeah but it's not the same yeah it's absolutely not the same yeah so again this is the invention of this next step that it's becoming clearer that the rules are being broken that she's really defining Mm -hmm. what can happen in literature and because of this more people got involved more Mm -hmm. people were interested by the time you get to the third one you're hooked um obviously the first two like in order to read two novels you have to already be hooked but this is like this is the moment when the craze started and you can talk to most fans most fans will agree that by the time they got to the third one that's when they became fans well it's also when the fandom exploded like by based on from my memory of it the first two books like there was a fandom i participated in it but it was pretty small you know there wasn't really much to it there yeah. there there wasn't and and the fandom wasn't very big because there were really not that many adults in the fandom at that time there were some of course because you can't have a fandom if there's no adults making fan content right but it was mostly kids chatting on a forum um and then yeah. when this third book came out all of a sudden here comes all these adult fans and now we have fanfic and fan art and it just like poof, it just exploded and there was so much content I was not engaged in the fandom at this point. I hadn't even started reading by the time the third book came out. I didn't start reading until the fourth book had come out. 
Um, so I don't remember any of that, but I know that that is true, that it, it really was this explosion in popularity of adults. Mm-hmm. And that this is no longer a kid's book. Yeah. This is, a book this is like when my parents, when my parents started reading it, we were like, mom, dad, exactly, you really need yeah. to read these. And they were like, okay. And they read them. <laughs> or where it was started to be referred to, hey, instead of having your kids read this independently, uh, you could read it as a whole family to younger mm-hmm. kids as well as older kids. Mm-hmm. And, and it's literally because of how it's written, how the, how the fiction is more in line to adult fiction, but wasn't adult fiction yet. Yeah. Uh, and that is the invention of, of YA right there. Um, so again, so the YA, uh, this invention, it, because it was a new territory, Harry Potter's YA looked very different from what YA looks today. Today, there's actually more of a YA formula. Um, and there's and there are split genres that are happening because of this new genre of YA was formed. You then really did get middle reader, middle grade yeah. readers, um, and YA readers, which is and so middle grade readers are typically third person point of view, which Harry falls in line with, uh, and are about personal issues. Whereas YA these days is first person point of view and are about societal issues. Mm -hmm. um and harry potter again creates both of those we Mm -hmm. see it so we came from children's literature where it's an adult we enter the third and fourth book which is about harry's personal journey and then we enter the fifth sixth and seventh book which is about societal journeys and how harry takes on this society you really do see how harry potter aligns with every single one of those young adults Yep. And what's so, and what's so fabulous about this also is it's like, it structurally changes the way that, um, that high school kids are expected to read and what they're expected to read, you know, like, like even though Harry Potter is not dystopian or anything like that, the, uh, the dystopian boom we had in the 2010s with Hunger Games and Divergent and all of the various ones, they wouldn't have happened without Harry Potter. Cause the other thing Harry Potter did is said, Hey, if you're writing for middle schoolers and high schoolers, it's okay to make them wait a year. You don't have to release a book every one to two months. You can keep their attention with one book a year. And nobody realized that before this moment, before Harry Potter was popular. And without the ability to release books more slowly, we wouldn't have, I don't think we would have, the the dystopian YA boom that we had in the 2010s. I don't think it would have happened because that type of book, you're not going to write a dystopia and release a new book every, every month. It's not going to work. You're not going to be able to tell that type of story. Well, yeah. And again, on top of that, it wasn't that YA authors were writing books every, every month or two. Yeah, they were, they were outlining uh, them in ghostwriting. <laughs> there was ghostwriting happening Yeah, where, where there would be an entire company. R.L. R. Stein is a great example. Uh, sorry if you think that all the Goosebumps books were written by one person. They weren't. Um, <laughs> and, and basically how it was is it was like, hey, I have this idea. Cool, write it and publish it under this name. Um, and then that's how authors could keep up. This really did bring power to people who were interested in writing and demographic and like who didn't want to, who didn't want to write the fancy, in-depth, meaningful fiction that like the works of art who just wanted to basically write stories that were consumable for most people. Because again, we're thinking like most people are also at a high school young adult reading level. Uh, Mm -hmm. Even if you've graduated college, most people tend to fall into that reading level. So when we're talking writing fiction as an author, you're talking about writing for a demographic that is above the average. Uh, If you wanna write towards the average, to be honest, write YA. Uh, And And that's that's why so many authors do. And that's why so many authors do because they can, that that is the, if you choose that as your target audience, you get the widest, um possible audience while still being focused on a genre which that's the sweet spot for making money right (laughs) what this also did too i mean and we can't it's not all harry potter because it was a lot of like the ya boom but again the ya boom is is really in line with harry potter it also changed how we consume consume adult fiction Mm -hmm. and what did adult and what did the rules of adult fiction are as well this really gave life to the story industry to the book industry don't get me wrong there were plenty of books plenty of popular authors before this but really the like mass market selling of like how much books can sell and where they can go 
really exploded with this. Yep. So it's important to remember that when we're talking about this third book, is that it mm-hmm. really was industry changing. Absolutely. So let's talk about what happens in the book. Okay, <laughs> guys. So so uh, Landon's going to give us a summary, <laughs> just like she did for the second book, um, just so that you guys are, are aware so that we don't have to kind of keep referencing back to plot points. Um, but this is going to be, this is our summary of the third book. And, uh, and they're going to get longer from here, so please bear with us. I, the summaries are not perfect, and the more complex the books get, the harder it is to summarize it in a meaningful amount of words. So uh, with that being said, Landon, go ahead. What happens in The Prisoner of Azkaban? Well, in the most exciting and thrilling book yet, we meet Harry as the abuse he suffers during the summer holidays is once again escalated. Uh, Vernon's sister comes to join the Dursleys for the summer, and her abusive words and insults towards his family cause Harry to let forth his accidental magic and turn her into a human balloon. As a result, he runs away to Wizarding London. For the first time ever, Harry is free to enjoy his holiday. A 13-year-old boy with a fortune at hand living unsupervised in the most magical alley in Britain. It's surprising nothing went wrong. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Returns to school, but after being given the warning that the escaped convict that he had seen on Muggle television was in fact a wizard, the most dangerous wizard in the world, and he was coming right for Harry to finish the job that the Dark Lord could not. Uh... On the way to Hogwarts, we run into the most terrifying creature that J.K.R. could have created, which is depression personified. After being attacked by his own outrageous amounts of trauma, uh, the newest Hogwarts professor, who is a sit for some reason took the train with the the other students, saves Harry and explains that the mentors were there to search for Sirius Black. The school year starts as normal. But as the book veers away from classes, the, we, as the readers, get more drama of what's happening on the outside, like the Quidditch game, where uh, Draco dresses up as a Dementor and uh, tries to get, in order to get Harry Potter's attention, and, or attention, and when that doesn't work, Draco insults a hippogriff uh, and demands for it to die once it attacks him. The, uh, the trio and Hagrid are incredibly close to this beast and so find this a tragic affair. Uh, There's also drama about not being able to go into the local wizarding town of Hogsmeade, uh, a tragedy that is later rectified when Fred and George give Harry a magical map that we later learn that his father helped make. And of course, there is drama between Ron and Hermione as as their friendship, in their friendship, due to the fact that Hermione is a cat person and has a cat and Ron has a rat. Uh, Harry learns from Remus Lupin how to protect himself against the Dementors by thinking about happy thoughts. Something that is very hard to do as he discovers Sirius Black is in fact his godfather. He really did, Harry really did think this year was going to be better than the others. He should learn by now. When spring arrives, the Buckbeak is executed and Ron is captured by a big black dog. But that is when the tryst reveals the big, bag, the big black dog is no one other than Sirius Black and none of it is true. Sirius is innocent, and it was Scabbers, Ron's rat, the whole time, who was disguised, who was disguised as, Scatter, as Scabbers, and is actually Peter Pettigrew, another friend of Harry's parents, that was the one to betray them all along. As, they are, as Sirius is captured by the Dementors, it is up to Hermione and Harry to go back in time, using the time turner that Hermione has had all along, taking all of her classes for the whole year. They stop, but they stop Buckbeak from being murdered. They rescue Sirius Black, and all is well when Harry is granted permission by the still presumed guilty Sirius to attend Hogsmeade weekends for his fourth year. Woo! And that's Harry all right. Potter, the Prisoner of Azkaban. <laughs> Landon, will you please let your cat out of the room? He is meowing like crazy. Um, so yeah, that is that is basically all the important stuff that happens in in the fourth book. Uh, I'm sorry, in the third book. It gets bonkers. Y'all, there's time travel. Do you remember this is the book that they introduced the time turner and we actually get um, some time travel magic. So um, so we would like after the summary to take just a moment to talk a little bit about the magical items in this book because oh my god the the magical items not only do you do we get so much more of them in this book but the uses explode. Oh, yeah. um, so we're going to take some time to talk about those. 
and these aren't even these are the ones that we found important to the plot i was actually thinking after like karen and i had our talk but there's things like the night bus mm-hmm. and uh, a magical book eating book that wants to eat things mm-hmm. uh, things like that so but the big three the first one is the invisibility cloak and the curse of giving an OP magical item too early in the series. <laughs> and, uh, and and it's not until later books that um, the J.K. Rowling and her editors start to learn this lesson. Um, but it was it was a mistake made in the first book to give Harry an inv- invisibility cloak. Like, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful idea if, if all of these novels were going to continue to be children's mysteries. However, once we pivot into this um more of a narrative storytelling less of a mystery more more about the drama more about harry's internal monologue the invisibility cloak just becomes op as fuck and in this book harry gets like harry has this problem right he has he's present we're presented with this problem um nobody wants to sign Harry's permission slip because it needs to be signed by one of the Dursleys as his legal guardians and and no one's going to override them in this case for whatever reason. I don't know. British people really like their rules. Whatever. I think this it's dumb. Rule, though, I think it's dumb. Every fine. other rule they don't care. But like if this was America, let's be real, if this was happening in America, McGonagall would have just been like, give me that shit. And she would have just been like, okay, here's and I he she would be like, okay, I, I I don't know what you're talking about, Harry. Vernon signed it. His signature's right yeah. here. You know? It's not like they're in constant contact. Like, it's not like they're in contact back home with the Dursleys. So who cares? Just fucking forge the signature. No one knows what Vernon Dursley's handwriting looks like. You're at boarding school. They're in zero contact with your family. Yeah, like, and like, and none of his friends mention this. Nowhere, nowhere does like Fred and George be like, uh, "Harry, just sign his name." Sign Which, if these name. were, if this was an American school, that's exactly how it would have gone down. I don't know. I guess in the UK, it's different. Whatever. Don't don't ask me just, why. It makes no sense. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things where Jake and Riley needed a problem that wasn't the climax, and so he yeah, put that in there. So he has this problem, but he but he has this very easy way to get around this problem, which is the invisibility cloak, right? So the the fact that that we introduced this problem and um and he has all these conversations about it, but it was a non problem to begin with because he always had the invisibility cloak. He could have gotten around this. Now that's not actually how they end up getting around it in the narrative, um exactly. There's more to it than that. But um the truth is this this never had to be a problem because he always had this invisibility cloak. He can go wherever he wants, whenever he wants. It doesn't matter. And I think it's just one of those things when you're like, I don't even, I don't even think this is a mistake on like how something was written. Uh, but this is just one of those mistakes as a writer when you're writing a series that you're like, oh yeah, this thing that I thought was really cool when this kid was 11 is actually going to fuck me when he's 18. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and nobody thinks about that. Nobody no. thinks about that. You just yeah. do your best in later books to try to write around it. <laughs> exactly. And you can't, you can't like hyper think about that um but what it does mean is again yes we have the automatic answer to these problems um and like yeah harry could literally have just followed ron and hermione down in the invisibility book he could and no one would have fucking known uh (laughs) but instead uh that didn't happen instead we had to introduce another magical item Let's fix our magical problems with more magic. <laughs> map, which, yeah. by the way, fucking coolest magical item in the world, but also, I'm not sure how it works. <laughs> it's never explained, not it's, really. It's one of those things where I have to suspend my already suspended belief, where I'm just like, but how, does that mean nothing ever gets rebuilt? Does that mean it how does it know who's in this it's just too much it's just too much but it's so cool i love the marauders map i love the marauders map and all of its problems i love the marauders map itself i love how it's used in the text i love the fandom jokes about it how obviously um fred and and george just never question why ron had this best friend named peter Pettigrew that no one ever talked about and and ron never mentioned so like fred and george to the borough come on never and harry and hermione get invited but why not why not peter so you know i guess it's just you know ron has a secret boyfriend and Fred and George just never tell anyone. That's the, you know that's very nice of them because they're pretty troublesome big brothers. But at least they did that for Ron. Never made fun of it. <laughs> um, 
and just <laughs> and like also i appreciate how it's used later in the series of like just harry potter obsessively stalking draco malfoy uh mm. and Ginny weasley like just mm-hmm. being like i am going to know where you are every single second of every single day because of my magic map yeah uh yep. it's beautiful <laughs> it's it's just it's a stalker's best birthday gift uh and, De- and and definitely totally cool for a teenager to have they wouldn't bring out their worst impulses at all and, ever and it's so cool for a teenager to have but not only for a teenager to have but the fact that a teenager made this mm-hmm. and we'll get into this with the with the marauders and like being like how smart were these children um <laughs> because this is such a cool thing that children children made because in in the books, they they refer to it the fact that they were using it in fifth grade in fifth year, which mm-hmm. means they were fifteen when they invented this magical thing that could tell you everyone that was in the castle exactly where they were at any given minute for the entirety of the rest of cre- human creation because it will continue to make new names. And also but because it- of the existence, because of the existence of this Marauder's map. So we know that they have the magical technology to do this. And then, so we then must assume that the way that the ministry knows things like when children do perform magic that they shouldn't, right? Cause they know that without anyone reporting it, right? They, they also know, um, you know, where to go pick people up for the night bus service, where the wizards are and they're waiting for the night bus. They know all of these things, right? Um, so it, it, it implies through its existence that this particular piece of magical technology is how the ministry tracks all of the wizards in Great Britain. Um, so that implies that there is a marauder's map of the entire nation of Great Britain. Which, by the way, is later, is later like, yes, they, they do because they have trackers on mm-hmm. kids who are performing underage magic. Mm-hmm. So like that is just kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah. So there's there like, there like is the ultimate big brother. <laughs> yeah. So there is so it's implied that there is a there is a Marauders map for the entire country, um, which I I think is fantastic. And it wouldn't necessarily be implied that's how they're doing it, except that this particular magical item exists, and it's our only example really of how they could have been potentially doing these things that we know that they're doing through how it affects. Harry and, and the others, you know, and how they, the, the ministry knows things that, how would they know that if nobody reported it, right? Um, but they do know, and it must be through this. We have to assume that. We have no, no other evidence. <laughs> this is just, I mean, this is, this is quintessential JKR of creating a problem because of, uh, of something that she didn't have foresight for, which I don't blame her for. And instead, instead of finding a way to solve it within canon, she instead then creates a magical item that becomes that loophole that solves that problem uh but then opens up a thousand more problems for her. <laughs> yeah. uh and, and this is seen with the marauders map because in book six when he's stalking draco malfoy uh she doesn't want harry to know where draco's going so she has to break the rules of her own creation to sit there and be like oh they know everything about this place except for this one thing that we know characters have already found Mm-hmm. And that we, our main protagonist, the Room of Requirement, our main protagonist has known about for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they never found this thing. Uh, it's untraceable on the map. It, it, can't, it doesn't exist on there. Like, breaking her own rules again. Getting mm-hmm. in her own way. Mm-hmm. Which it really, just, it really just goes to prove that, like, what she's doing in writing Harry Potter isn't anything different than anyone else that's writing fantasy is doing. She didn't have this all planned out at the beginning. Nobody that writes this stuff really has it all planned out from the beginning. No, how, no matter how much of a planner you are, it's impossible. So when she says these types of things in interviews, just know she's full of shit. She's doing it the same way everybody else is, making the same mistakes everybody else does. Yeah, um, it's, it's not different. <laughs> it's not my different. Critique is, my critique is not on the fact that this happened. My critique is on the fact that she then pretends that it didn't happen. Yeah, it totally happens. <laughs> like you're a writer, just make just admit that you're like, yeah, I didn't know what to do, so I invented a map where you could see everybody. Like, yeah, you're right. I had to, I had to come up with a reason for why Harry couldn't just just couldn't just go to Hogsmeade, and then I had to get him to Hogsmeade at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I had to like make it so it was interesting that he didn't go for first because I needed him to talk to Remus Lupin. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to write the Marauders map. Exactly exactly um and again also understanding that when she was writing this she was not expecting thousands and millions of people to 
dive deep into putting all of these things together. Yeah, I mean, like, you don't know. You don't know when you start these things which of your series is going to get popular and which ones no one's going to care about. You have no idea. So, yeah. and also to the point of popular, like we're this isn't even this is beyond popular. This is mm-hmm. the world changing mm-hmm. things. Um. So yeah, but let's talk about J.K. Rowling getting in her own way again with another magical item. Okay, so this, you know. This t- okay. I want to. I want to get on my soapbox here with this because yeah. this is something you know. I mean, the whole purpose of me making content in the first place was to help you guys become better writers, um, better role players, things like that. So this is. I'm going to take this moment to go back to writing advice, Karen, for a second. Unless your story is about time travel, do not add time travel. It doesn't work. Unless your story is about that and structured on that in the beginning, you will always make grave, terrible errors, which is exactly what happens with the Time Turner. Now, the Time Turner, as it exists in the third book, is actually incredibly clever and wonderfully used. I really like it. I love how it helps everything tie up at the end, but it gets in the way later so much so, oh, we know time travel exists now. You can do a little bit of time travel, at least, you know, in, in small increments, right? So long as you don't go talk to yourself, it's it's pretty much okay. But because that exists, what that means later is JK Rowling realizes like, oh shoot, I have to destroy all the time turners because the fact that they exist just create too many plot holes for me to deal with. And who could? Like, who could? It's impossible. So if your story's not about time travel, don't add time travel. Just don't do it. Because you're going to have to destroy all of your time travel later. And there is no, like, there is no successful time travel. There has not been a single series in the history of the world that, as far as fiction, as far as I'm aware, that has done time travel correctly. Well, it's, it's whatever it's whatever you feel is correct, right? But if, if the piece is about time travel, then then I can enjoy it. Like, I love Back to the Future. I think that's a great movie. Um, but it's it's about time travel. The entire premise is built on time travel. So it's good, you know, and, and, and it's telling its story. There's also, like, holes of, of how things... Yeah, I mean, it's it just... It, time travel in general is going to create a thousand more problems, even if your thing is about time travel. And if your thing is about time travel, then you are taking the time to think about and accept the fact that there are going to be plot holes, that there are going to be people who don't, who don't agree with this level of time travel, that, uh, that it's just, I've never seen Back to the Future, so I can't critique it, but I was like thinking of Doctor Who, that there are just, (laughs) there are just parts of it when you have a living series, a living movie, a living media books, anything like that. Uh, that time travel is going to come back to bite you in the ass. And if, it will, yeah. main, if your main purpose is time travel, you accept that, that just like everything else is going to come back to bite you in the ass in fiction. It's part mm-hmm. of the, it's a part of the writing story about time travel. If you are using time travel as a way to get out of something or the way to make something cool, it's going to be 10,000 times worse. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I think the time travel was, was originally introduced as, as a, a magical, interesting way to uh to help Hermione have a, a character arc, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in this, we are going to take some time to talk a little bit about um, Hermione. But but I and I think that uh, that you know, and that's great, and the way that it's used is great. But what I... that means is that you have all of these other problems later that it's like, well, why don't they just time travel? And I actually think it's a slightly opposite. Um, I think that she she wrote herself into a corner of being like, how are we going to get Sirius Black out of the situation after he's been taken by... Oh, so you think the Time Turner was like a, a second or third draft thing that I was think, added in I think that at she the end. added Hermione having that stuff in as a way to lay the foundation of this this magical item that doesn't just come out of nowhere. Mm, maybe. Or this magical item that we're... And, and we don't know the process, but and, and, and either way, it doesn't matter because it serves both purposes correctly. Mm-hmm. However, I think that that is probably, I think that that on a writing standpoint, that's the bigger plot. Part. And, and the way that it's used in this book is so clever. And this is the same thing it that is. I think is so clever about this book that elevates it above the first two is that everything is so well set up and foreshadowed. And the time turner is a wonderful example of that. You've got this plot point where um, Hermione is somehow attending more classes than is physically possible. How the heck is she doing that? Oh, but it all comes back in the end in this super satisfying way. The same thing with like, is Sirius? Black is introduced 
in the very beginning. Like, Sirius Black is introduced while while um, Harry is still at the Dursleys, which that doesn't happen in other books. And in other books, we learn about, you know, the, the antagonist or the pseudo-antagonist after he gets to Hogwarts, right? Or or much later in the book when it comes to the, the Chamber of Secrets. It takes forever for us to figure out what the heck is going on there. Um, but in this book, what makes it so satisfying is all of these things that are, that are so crucial to the end of the book are introduced very very early which is the time turner with uh with what hermione's doing now we don't know it's a time turner but we know hermione's doing some kind of weird time thing um we know that that sirius black is on the loose we know that hagrid is now the the care of magical creatures professor right um we meet remus lupin on the train which is really silly when you think about it from a real life standpoint but it's actually very clever because we get to meet him very early before we even get to hogwarts right like all of these things are set up like just beautifully so early in the book we don't have to wait and that's another example of a genre shift, right? Yeah. Like, so you have, instead of having um, a lot of realizations, like in children's literature, to keep kids interesting, where you have a lot of mini plot arcs of, uh, oh, here's the conflict, here's the rising action, here's the thing that solves the conflict, and now we're fine, and then we're going on to the next one. Many, mm-hmm. many things like that. You have hints that build to the overall story of mm-hmm. having these things. So and the time turner is such a good in. example of it oh the time turner is an amazing example and also the time turner as a piece of like literature technology is awesome it gives rules that it only does it one or two hours you need to turn you know it needs to be you need to be physically able to turn like mm-hmm. how many times you want to go in the past that it's yep. an hour increments that it's not unlimited power that it really mm. is this, like, there are rules dictated to it, which is awesome. It's a very well thought out piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also a very well, like, established piece within the book. And it is that yep. camp. However, again, yeah, like you said, she has to destroy all of them in the fifth. And then, and I know, <sighs> Cursed Child is canon. Like, she did help, she oversaw it, she signed her name on it. So <laughs> we have to take that as a part of canon. She then breaks the rules and brings back another more powerful time turner to ignore everything. And that's part of like, that's part of why Cursed Child sucks because it's full of doing that. Mm-hmm. But of, of completely ignoring everything that she had done. So she realized time turners are an issue. She gets rid of all the time turners and then she brings time turners back and it ruins it. it ruins yeah, the there's, I mean, there's, there's several things wrong with Cursed Child, but the oh, time turners are. being a major part of the plot is a huge one yeah. of the things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I know that we're we're like a year away from it, but when we get to it, instead of doing favorite things, can we do least favorite things? Oh my god, please. <laughs> I have no favorite things about that book. Yeah, none. <laughs> Um, um, the Hermi- Hermione getting, uh, her- uh, Black Hermione, the lady that plays Hermione, um, whatever her name is. There we true, go. Yeah. Favorite thing. She does a really Favorite good thing. job. Uh, also the special effects on stage are awesome. But yeah, there we go. Actual novel, no. <laughs> but if you try to okay. read it, you don't get any of that. So, Terrible. but anyway, so, so time turners, um, talking about Hermione again, uh, they, they are, the time turner is a critical part of the plot arc, the character arc that Hermione goes on. And so we would like for this book, finally, to talk a little bit about Hermione. And be- before we, uh, get into the pieces, I just want to let y'all know, did you know that there is like absolutely zero official art of Hermione Granger? My What's mind was blown. It doesn't exist. So we we've tried really hard for these last two slideshows for the uh, for the prisoner not prisoner sorry chamber of secrets and sorcerer's stone to use concept art which is official Harry Potter art that then informed the movies or informed the uh, the like visual visualizations within the books uh, for mm-hmm. the new versions of the of the books yeah also uh, informed a lot of the stuff they did in the theme parks and etc yeah, etc absolutely and but it's all official we don't use we don't use fan art we don't use anything like that we use official art there is no fucking official art of, of Hermione Granger I looked and Karen looked mm-hmm. and it's either because so much there's so much fan art that is so popular that it has poured all of the concept art which I have a feeling is what it is concept art down or no one likes the concept art, so it's just faded into obscurity. I, I can't find it. I mean, so I for, for y'all, it's, it's just gone. So for y'all that don't know, a big part of our process is um, Landon does the first draft on these um, on these PowerPoints, right? So typically, she's the one going and finding 
the artwork and she messages me and she's like well the powerpoint's done but i can't find any art of hermione granger so i don't know what to do with her slide and i was like okay well i'll go look and um and i'm, I'm looking i'm looking in every way every place every way i can i'm looking like hermione granger official art hermione granger concept art um hermione granger book covers you know da da da, da everything it doesn't exist y'all it doesn't exist i don't think i don't think it's that the fan art is su super popular so anyway that's why we're looking at emma watson instead of some hermione granger fan art if anybody uh, sorry some hermione granger official art if anybody knows where some Hermione Granger concept art or official art is, I would love to see it because I couldn't find it. And I feel, I feel empty now because I feel like it should exist. And I feel like it has to exist. Like it, it the, there is a, there is a graphic novel version of, of Harry I don't know. Potter. I don't know, Landon. The more I read JK Rowling's later in life takes, the more I realize how much she really has issues with her gender. And, and I'm kind of, and we know Hermione Granger is kind of herself insert. We know that from things she said in interviews. I don't know. I kind of maybe think it doesn't really exist for real. Ugh, that'd be <laughs> <so sad. sighs> all right. But if you can find some, we would love to see them. Uh, if not, that's why all of the photos here are, um, are from That's me. why it's Emma Watson. And we kept it consistent that the entire, almost, I think there's a couple that are concept art, but there's a couple uh, that most of the images from this slideshow is movies. We're trying to separate the two and appreciate the art for the art. Um, yeah, but, but it just, it just didn't exist. We couldn't uh, find it. So, so you got more screenshots this particular presentation than others. <laughs> all right. So speaking of Hermione. Yes. One of the biggest things we we really see in this book, but we have also seen in past books and will continue to see, is that Hermione's number one thing is determination. If yep. she has a goal, she will be she will do anything, anything to get to it. Mm -hmm. She is a uh, powerhouse. She is an absolute oh. powerhouse. So you might think like Hermione has this reputation of being the smart one, right? Because she's always doing good on her tests. She's always getting answers right in class. She's always doing extra reading and things like that. But she's not in Ravenclaw, right? And that's like a, that's like a whole thing that she goes through, right? And, and characters comment on it in later books and things like that. But I think she never could have been in Ravenclaw because her core being and what she believes in is not necessarily intelligence she believes in education because the way that Hermione sees it is this is a goal that's been set in front of her that she has been told if you get educated then you will go on to do great things and so she says yes I want that you know it's not learning for learning's sake it's she's just determined to meet every goal that's set before her I also think that there's a lot of we know that Hermione knows the implication of her blood status Yes. prior to arriving to Hogwarts, which means that her determination, I think her determination for why she needs to be the best, head of the class, do the most, all of those things is because she is determined to show that her blood status does not mean shit. It yep. doesn't mean anything. And so that is, it is that determination and drive. I don't think, I think Hermione is naturally gifted. I think she comes from a privileged family. Both of her, uh, both of her parents are dentists. They make a good mm -hmm. salary. She's an only child. Uh, she lives in a good place in London. So she definitely comes from a place of privilege. Um, and I think that, so that gives her, that gives her levels. But I think honestly that she is probably, she's not naturally the smartest person in the class. Right. I don't think she naturally, like, I think that like, there are people who will, pro who are probably on par with her intelligence wise that don't have to do the work that she does. Mm-hmm. She puts in all of that work for the pure goal of sitting there and saying, I will not be, I will not prove them right. I will prove mm -hmm. them wrong. Mm -hmm. And I will do this and I will be the best. Yep. Now it's um, not, it's not the same as like an, as an economic difference, but like the real life corollary is something like um, somebody that's the, that's a first generation college student that yeah. goes, that goes in and, um, and they're like, damn it, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to prove I can do this, you know, regardless of what anyone else says, regardless of what anyone else expects of me. And I think that's exactly what it is. And Hermione shows that over and over because somebody that truly is like really smart, like anybody that was in these gifted programs or honors classes or things like that, y'all, I'm just going to be real. Like we didn't, we didn't act like Hermione. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't study that much. We didn't do extra reading. I mean, we did what we were assigned, but like we didn't do extra work, um, you know, to, to be smart. And we didn't necessarily answer all the questions in class. I mean, some, some people did, but most gifted students were literally just like, 
And there's other mechanisms that were going on that were that were creating that situation. You know, it's it, her, it, Hermione doesn't have any of that. What she has is determination. That is her defining character trait is when she sees something that she wants, she is going to freight train barrel through every wall put in front of her to get the thing she wants. Doesn't and matter what it is. She's going to do it. That is shown by the fact that she lights Snape's robes on fire in the first book. Yep. It's shown by the fact that she literally puts herself in physical danger of dying in order to prove about the basilisk. Mm-hmm. It is uh, shown in this book by literally driving herself to the brink of insanity so she can take every single classes, classes that she doesn't even enjoy in order to prove that she can do it, that she is the best. Yep. But I do love that at the end of this book, she does admit that like she took it a little too far. And she's like, this was a terrible idea. And maybe I don't need to push myself this hard. Like, it's okay to also hang out with my friends. And so I do think she gets a little bit smarter in this book. Because you kind of see that in the beginning where um, where she's shown to do some really nasty things. Like, she really is not very sympathetic to Ron's situation with his rat. And and, and even more so when, um, when that other girl can't find her pet bunny. I think, is it Lavender that loses her pet bunny? Whoever it is. One of the girls, one of the Gryffindor girls loses her pet bunny funny and um and Hermione's just like whatever like it'll it'll turn up it's like fine like she has no she she doesn't she doesn't have any care or whatever and the girl's like well you don't understand because it's not your pet and it's like no Hermione doesn't understand because she really just isn't very smart about thinking about people outside of herself (laughs) that's just the truth um (laughs) she she I love I love I always loved that there was like this line in the sixth book and I think it's only a movie line when we get there I'll we'll all see no, it's not. It is a, it's a book run. Sorry, just remembering that. Uh, where she's accusing Ron of having the emotional range of a teaspoon. Uh, and it's very funny because in these, in these earlier books, uh-huh. she does as well. She's Which, projecting. She's so uh, projecting. <laughs> I think that when she comes, when, as girls do develop uh, earlier than the boys. So I do think she has more of an emotional awakening before Harry and Ron do mm-hmm. uh, in certain degrees. But I think that, yeah, she, she, she does not look at other people's perspectives or other people's point of views or have empathy for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that's shown also in ways that she treats Harry. Yeah. Like, like Harry has I, a nasty internal monologue about her, but she doesn't really, you know, she doesn't really give him much to work with there. So. <laughs> you know, and Ron, obviously too. She's never really yeah. kind to Ron. Ron's never really kind to her. Um, and I say that as a Hermione shipper, I acknowledge it. But she, she is not great. She is not She is not the loving, caring, maternal friend that I think the fandom makes her out to be. Yeah, I yeah. think there's this idea that because she is a woman, she is more emotionally mature, that she does care about them. And I'm like, no. Hermione mm-hmm. is, she, ha- she puts her blinders on. If she has a goal, she will reach it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is why she can hurt Ron when, like, when Ron makes out with Lavender in the fifth book. Uh, and she's she has a crush on Ron. It's why she can like physically hurt him. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because she has this blinder on and this thing that she needs. And if she's not going to get there, then she will hurt anyone and anything that's in that way. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think when it comes when it comes to uh, Hermione, like she she does she does though she has more work to do in her emotional growth than Ron does because Ron from the very beginning he can see people's other people's perspectives he's relatively emotionally mature for an 11 year old when we meet him you know because he's always had to look at other people's perspective because he lived with a gajillion other people in his house right and Hermione didn't she was an only child so Ron doesn't have nearly as far to go in his emotional development whereas Hermione has to make like huge leaps throughout the series to become a more mature person. And and I think that where, what the fandom also forgets is that the reason Harry, Ron, and Hermione are friends is because they're trauma bonded. They are trauma bonded from what happened with the troll in the bathroom. And that is why they're friends. And then everything, and then everything else that happens from there. Well, yeah. And then I, it just gets worse and worse every year. <laughs> um, and, and like, I do, I, and we can, and I'm sure we'll have, a conversation about like future what we what we like about the fandom of, of post harry potter but i i think that that will continue to like bind them for the rest of their lives but they have very little in common with one another 
Um, Mm -hmm. They have very little in common with one another until they start on this adventure. Right. Thank you. So, um, yeah, no, it's... (laughs) Sorry, I just saw the text to the queen. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> yes, I will tell queen of your generous donation tap. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that is an important thing that that the fandom really likes to ignore about her. Mm-hmm. That she is not, she is ruthless in her determination. Yeah, Jane's quote, do you want to stop Snape from getting that stone or not? Yeah, exactly. That's a quintessential Hermione line. Um, The fact that she, like, she can... I mean, and, and Harry does it too, so it's, this might not be an only Hermione thing. But, like, Ron kill, like almost kills himself in the chess game. And Hermione's, like, cool with staying on the square. <laughs> like, she's, she's, like, cold and chill and, like, fine. She's like, yeah, we gotta win this, win this game of chess in the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, she has very little qualms about it. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong, that's not a bad thing. But I think that, that we see this more in The Prisoner of Azkaban because things start cracking Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's because she has put too much on her plate yeah uh and even though you're right at the end of this book she does grow to the point where she's like maybe i won't take divination and maybe i do hate this subject that i don't want to take like i'm not interested in it um but she still constantly puts too much on her shoulders Absolutely. Well, this is kind of the development, right? Because she she is the lead female character of um, of Harry Potter, right? Like she is. So um, we can we can move to the the next bullet, I think. But she is she is the the quote unquote strong female character in in the book. So even though she learns like maybe too many classes, that's I don't want to do too many classes. But then she's like, oh, but um, maybe I'm gonna fill my time with trying to liberate the the house elf slaves, right? And she starts spew. And that's a whole other thing. When we get to when we get to spew, we'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk about the house elves as a concept and what that means. But um, but she is constantly and regularly trying to be everything for everyone. And I think that's part of why um, Hermione is is so relatable to a lot of people. And and part of why what ends up happening in the movies, because as as we know through. Um, interviews the director of the movies was a Hermione stan he thought Hermione was the best character and he thought she was so cool and and uh, and she should have a bigger role and da 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 and that's part of why a lot of things in the movies are a little bit different for Hermione and why some of Ron's uh lines and things are given to Hermione and some of his tasks are given to Hermione um but I think I think we have this urge because she's the main female character to turn her into everything for everyone and and as as a fandom we regularly do this and i feel like it happens in the movies too as an adaptation because she's it she is the strong female character i don't even want to say she's the strong female character she is the only female pretty much character. we've got a couple in the chat that are mentioning other things we've got we're mentioning mcgonagall and luna Which y'all are just pretending no y'all are just mcgonagall makes an appearance a little bit in the first one yeah and- a little bit in the third one she's barely mentioned in the second one yeah she we have no character development at all for her through the entire series no she's background character at best yeah and, and i mean y'all i hear what y'all are saying but I'm, I'm sorry i have to i have to disagree like they luna and any female character that you name has well, nothing on what happens to hermione in this book and luna doesn't come in until the fifth yeah Ginny is not even a Ginny is a nuisance to harry in the second one Mm -hmm. um she doesn't like her whole shtick in the second one is she says no words around him in fact she says nothing around him until the fifth book when luna is introduced at the same time when she had better editors to tell her that she needed more female characters but that's (laughs) uh (laughs) she says nothing that's the whole idea Mm -hmm. she says nothing molly weasley is the only other female character that we get consistent messaging from and we only get her in the second one, and we kind of get her a little bit in the third one. Yeah, Not and then like- there's Cho, and then there's Cho Chang, which like I love Cho Chang. I think she's a wonderful character, but um, she really is just there for specific plot purposes. As far as Harry's romantic life, she doesn't really have a character arc either. In the background, she does, but we never really fully learn about it. We just have to infer all, what's happening to her. All fanon, and also she's there as a like she doesn't have a personality on on me like what the text gives us she doesn't have a personality not really she's her personality is sports her personality is sports and someone that harry could kind of like yeah and she's cute 
She's, she loves sports and she's a cutie. <laughs> That's her personality. Um, we don't know anything else about her. I'm not dissing Luna, oh, Lunar. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say. I love Luna, but but um, but um, but none of the other female characters in Harry Potter uh, have have the impact. None of them else have character. None of the other ones have character arcs. None of the others contribute to the plot. It's really just Hermione. She's the um, only one. So I will say that the, they start having character arcs. Uh, Ginny has a character arc starting yeah. in in the fifth yeah but it's um, not until like we're talking about the fifth and sixth book and then in the seventh book everyone disappears again because the trio's out in the woods right no it's incredibly incredibly important to remember that we are not talking fanon we are yeah. not talking fandom we are talking media mm -hmm. uh we can talk about how brilliant the female characters are and the skeletons that have been written by the ounce of information that we've been given but we have been given scraps yeah. It is canon, fandom, and actors that have yeah. and actor interviews, not even actors of the of the people that have made these characters worthwhile. Yep. Yeah, Jane, I mean that's a great that's a great tidbit we get about Cho as well. But because um because Harry is the way that he is, we we don't really find out a lot about like about that. She just she goes and does that and uh, and then she feels really bad about it. Cho but Cho doesn't do and, that. Yeah, so it's Mariana who does it in the books. Cho yeah. is just, so they've had a lack of another female character in the movies. Mm -hmm. So, no, it's it's important to remember that not only is Hermione Granger the strong female character, she is the only female character. Yeah, the only one that matters. That that kids who this book is directed towards, so we're talking 13 to 18, 12 to 18, mm -hmm. actually can identify with. Because you know what? I guarantee you there isn't a 12 or 13 year old that can truly identify with Molly Weasley as she is in the book. <laughs> Man, there's probably how one. Burnt out, <laughs> how burnt out mom is. Like they don't know how to be one. Some of them yeah. do. But they're like, it's Hermione Granger is the character. Yeah, and because she's and because she's the the main female character, she gets pulled in so many different directions to do all of these different things. And and the thing that we have to remember also, um, we have to step back from our from our fan fandom. In, in Harry Potter is Harry Potter isn't an ensemble cast. There's really just the three main characters. Um, and uh, and in fan, and we like to pretend it's an ensemble cast. And we, we create things to make it into an ensemble cast, but the books are not, and neither are the movies. Nope. And even then, three. to the extent that there, there's even argument that there is a reason why the, the story is told in third person on mission to give us insight into Ron and Hermione, but really is Harry. Yeah. Everything is from Harry's perspective, too. Yep, for sure. So, no, I think that that is something extremely important. And so because of that, Fanon and how also she is read is like they want her to be pants. Mm -hmm. She isn't pants in the media. She actually doesn't follow that YA trope of the main female lead mm -hmm. being a soulless, personality-less person. Um, but people treat her like she is. Yep, they, they do. They ignore things about her because they expect her to be that that fit every single girl because every single girl wants to be Hermione because yeah. they want to be in it. Yeah, exactly uh, what Lunar's Lunar's saying and, and thank you for um thank you for getting rid of that uh that spam in there. But uh yeah, Hermione made me want to be a better student in high school. Like you're not alone in that. I a lot of my friends absolutely looked up to Hermione and thought she was just, you know, the best thing ever and she was so cool. And especially when um when Emma Watson came on the screen and breathed life into Hermione in a way that didn't yeah. exist in the books, like Emma, what I have to say for like my relationship and the way that I relate to Hermione, I didn't really relate to her in the books. I related much more just to the side characters. And as far as the trio, I related much more to, to Ron. Um, but, uh, but in the movies, what Emma Watson does with Hermione's character at, at the age that she does it is absolutely breathtakingly genius. She is incredibly inspiring watching her on screen just breathe life into this girl that I thought was kind of annoying in the books, you know? Um, and, and I really credit her for letting me see Hermione as a, as a valuable character that I could be interested in too. Absolutely. And, and Emma Watson, I mean, she, there, I don't think there is anybody who could play Hermione again. No, like, or at least as a child, because I agree, it she breathed life into a role that was. It's a really harsh life. I mean, the other thing we have to remember 
is the reason why Hermione is friends with Ron and Hermione, or Ron, not only because of trauma bonding, but because no one else wanted to be her friend. Mm -hmm. She is not a likable person. Yeah, she went months. She went months at Hogwarts with no friends until the troll thing happened. And she's not meant to be a likable person. Like, that's the other thing, too. I don't think the character, I don't think JKR ever lies to us about that. No. Maybe maybe when older, maybe when she gets, actually, no, I'm thinking of the fourth book now, uh, when Victor Crumb loves her out of nowhere. Uh, but she's but she's grown so much emotionally by then. So I think, and I think she deserves that, okay? I am here for Crumb and Hermione. In another world, I, I would have been a Crumb and wrong. Hermione shipper. <laughs> I shipped it. Don't get me wrong. I don't like it. However, it did feel a little heavy-handed where it was like, this international Quidditch star loves you because you don't talk to him. Like, well, you know what? We all have our type, and I cannot, <laughs> and I cannot blame Crumb. I mean, you know me. I have to go for Shane and Stardew Valley. Like, I mean, I get it. Okay, sometimes you like people that are very annoying, and that's just how that is. <laughs> cool, I'll take it. But I just, I think it's that important. It is important yeah. to remember. Yeah. Um, um, and then the other, I think, really important part of Hermione's character in this book, and we've mentioned it a few times, but I want to take some time to really dig into it, is her reaction to the divination class. So divination is something that I was incredibly drawn to and I always have been very drawn to. Like, y'all know, I like things like tarot cards and crystals and stuff like that. And it's from, it's from, for for me, and I've talked about this on stream too. We have a whole stream where we talk about ritual. For, For me, what keeps me kind of spiritually and emotionally sane is rituals. And it's very important in my life, even though I do not have um even though i don't have a lot of religious or or spiritual feelings in the way that other people do as far as a higher power and afterlife or things like that but ritual is very very important to me um so when i saw that divination existed in the harry potter world and they were doing things like reading tea leaves and horoscopes i was just instantly like my child self was like you know just straight to that the same way that i was just straight instantly attracted to the idea of a patronus i was just instantly attracted to the idea of divination in the Harry Potter universe that, oh, you could go to school and you could practice these these rituals as part of like an educational skill. My child mind was like, amazing. Oh my God. Um, and, and, I, and I found this part so interesting that like, oh, Trelawney is the, is the Ravenclaw, you know, head teacher, right? Uh, the smart house, which I also enjoyed. Uh, and she's the divination professor. And it was like, oh, and I just felt like in that moment, like, oh, she gets it. They get it that like intelligence and creativity are are interlinked in, in this way that it really isn't about the way that Hermione is smart. And it was just kind of this beautiful insight for me that was just like, oh, the author gets it. J.K. Rowling gets what intelligence really is. And I do think she hit the nail on the head with this. And I do, I do think she's absolutely right, you know? And, um, and I love, and I love that Hermione eventually rejects it and says, this is not for me because I can't just determination my way through it. You know, I have to feel through it. I have to be creative through it. And I, and Hermione is like, I cannot do this. This is not within my wheelhouse of skills. And, um, and it's like one of my favorite parts of this book, as well as my favorite parts of Hermione's character growth is her rejection of divination and and that solidifies her as a Gryffindor for me and really shows like she this, she belongs in the Gryffindor house she doesn't belong in Ravenclaw despite what ca- other characters might say not only did it solidify her in the Gryffindor house I think it it, it sh- I think that that is the moment of most growth that we see from her in general at all because it is that moment of I cannot be good at everything yeah and no that, one can like, being like oh here is the finish line that I am so determined to prove. I am so determined determined to prove I am going to be the best at everything to, to make sure that all of those haters, all of those people who just say I should not be here uh, are proved wrong. And like sitting there and being like, okay, maybe, maybe the, the line needs to be moved a little bit. So <laughs> I don't think that everything except definition. Um, <laughs> maybe I don't have to be good at everything. Maybe I can suck at a couple things. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good lesson for kids to learn because no one oh. can be good at everything. As someone who had to learn that lesson in uh, just because I'm naturally great at everything. Well, um, well. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> who does who who can 
relate, especially in my adulthood, not so much as my childhood, but in my adulthood of over committing to everything, <laughs> um, I can really relate to that moment of how hard it is to learn that lesson of sitting there and being like, actually, I cannot do this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to quit and not do this thing. Um, and it's, it's hard, but it's amazing that a 13 year old girl can do it. And 13 year old mm-hmm. girls are learning those lessons, which is awesome. Yep. Yep. I think she's in Hermione. Her, her, her Hermione goes through a wonderful teacher. Of that. Hell yeah. Thank you for that. How lunar. Exactly. It's good. No. It's a really good lesson. And, and Hermione, it, this is in this book, she shines. And I think she does a couple of other things. So we'll probably talk about her more in later streams, like when we get to Spew Absolutely. in particular. And also, you know, some of the things that she does in the final book. But in this book is where she really shines. She really, you know, steps out and is like, and, and shows everybody what a cool character she can be. And we wanted to, again, like give, give just a highlight to her since we have highlighted Ron and we have highlighted Harry. Mm-hmm. Um, have we highlighted Ron? No, we highlighted Jenny. We highlighted, well, we highlighted the Weasleys and we talked Ooh, about yes. Ron and we talked about the Weasleys. We talked about Ron at some point too, I'm sure. Yeah. In depth. Uh, he has a lot of growth to happen as well. Mm-hmm. All right. He hasn't gone through it yet, but he's going to. <laughs> uh, all those Ron haters out there can suck my dick. Yeah. Ron's great. great. Okay. Shall we move on to our next? Yes. Okay, so we are in a couple of weeks going to dive more into the Marauder specifically, but we wanted to at least give them a little bit of breath in this because there's a story structure thing that we wanted to talk about in the Marauders versus the Golden Trio. Um, And that each character in, in the Marauders has a similar counterpart in personality and story arc in the Golden Trio era that we're actually reading. And, um, and we think that is, that is very interesting in, in what it says. So, um, so Landon, if you could explain kind of like a little bit structurally what we're talking about, and then I will reveal who is who, because I think you're going to be surprised a little bit at the way that I think of this. Okay. So basically the way that we view the Marauders is that it is a group of four people who were really only friends with each other. Uh, and that each held sort of a personality type into that group that really like showed that formed a whole a whole ray of people mm-hmm. <laughs> like it showed it sh- like none of them were very similar they were all very different and each had a trope attached to them uh the golden trio is the same way that they are really people who are only friends with each other that have three very distinct personality types and uh each represent something Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I think that once we spread out from the Golden Trio and the Marauders, uh, and and especially in um, the Golden Trio age, we start seeing that character types that are similar, uh, but have different choices made. That one thing changed that character so that you have the same base ingredients, basically, of a character, but one thing changed the character. Uh, And it is very interesting how they all relate to each other and really mirror the stories that were being told in the 70s that we get glimpses of and the stories that are being told in the actual Harry Potter books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So, and I also think that that shows that J.K. Rowling might only know how to write one form of <laughs> well she does keep writing world war ii over and over and over again so <laughs> um so because there's like the weird thing about the nazis it's i don't know <laughs> <laughs> she pretty much knows how only she only knows how to write nazi allegories and um, um and this is just another way that that we see you know she's really writing the same thing over and over again with different flavors which isn't isn't it may sound like a diss but it's not really a well, diss because i'm not gonna lie i do the same things over and over too like you get obsessed with certain ideas and certain tropes and you just want to do them over and over every which way you possibly can and so if you take that into consideration and also throw in fantastic beasts and where to find them you will see the same exact thing yeah you will so okay so he, some of them are obvious some of them are obvious right like like well, harry let's- Let's talk about how obvious. How obvious is this one, Karen? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so so most of the corollaries are obvious, right? Like Harry oh. is James. They are both they are both the jock friend, they're the headstrong one, they're the leader-ish, right? And by the way, they actually look exactly like each other. Yeah. Which we'll get to here in a second, but 
Yeah. Yeah. They're that and job. then, and then Ron in the in the Golden Trio age is uh, is the same as Sirius in the Marauders age, right? Like they're the cool one, they're the chill one, they're there to hang out, right? Like they're we the things we know, jock, but they're like a side jock. It's not yeah. their personality. They're the cool um, guy. Yeah. They're the funny friend. They're the one that makes jokes. They're the one that doesn't take things too seriously. Mm-hmm. Seriously, get it? Ha ha. Uh, <laughs> and then yeah. we have, um, so so those are the two very obvious ones. And, and they get a little bit more different from each other from there. But I think the corollaries still exist. So then and the I next think, one. I think the third one's really obvious too. Yeah, I mean, once you've got those two, the third one's not, is, is pretty obvious, right? So the next one we have is Hermione. Um, in the Golden Trio era is Remus in the Marauders area era, right? That's the smart friend, the mom friend, the friend that's always going to make sure that everyone, um, you know, everyone it makes it on time to the appointment, right? And uh, and and we we see Remus as this type of character too. I mean, he's the one that becomes the professor, right? Um, he's he's uh, he's the one that's kind of um, downtrodden in the in the Marauders era because he's the werewolf, and and then Hermione is kind of downtrodden due to her blood status, right? Um, so they're they're the corollaries, and they're the inherently good characters, yeah, but also allow their morality to slide for their friends. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. They, they're trying to do the right thing but if they have to choose between the right thing and saving their friends they're gonna go save their friends <laughs> yep and then... and then and then we've got the very obvious one of neville is as the corollary to peter right so neville and this and this is a big difference this is where we start to see that different character choices result in different outcomes right because neville in in the um in the golden trio era they never really like super deeply bond with neville like he never really becomes part of the the group but once he does become part of the group later he really is able to grow into himself and be the brave person that he wants to be inside like when they start forming dada right um the and their their own dada thing with the um dumbledore's army that's what it's called when they start to do their own defense against the dark arts classes um and uh, and because uh, Neville goes through this this transformation where he really gets a chance to to practice the bravery he he wants to be. He's able to shine, and he doesn't and he doesn't go through this betrayal arc that Peter does. Whereas Peter bonds with the Marauders very early, and they have him as kind of their punching bag friend. He's their friend that's around, but he's kind of the weird one. He hangs out with them because um, nobody else really wa- yeah nobody really else wants to hang out with him. That no one finds attractive. Yeah. That is just kind of there and is basking in the coolness of the others. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, so he, because because he he's constantly, you know, at it, this kind of fake friend to the Marauders, uh, he, he ends up betraying them. Right. You know, because he's not he's not living. Honestly, he's not living his truth. And and because he and I don't even think it's fake friends. They're never he never truly feels I at least. I don't think he's ever really friends with Hermione, Ron, and Harry. I think he's friendly with them, but he feels, but Neville feels more involved, especially when he gets Luna, um, that by the time war breaks out for the second, for, for the golden trio, he feels more included that he isn't going to betray him. So that he does the exact opposite of that betrayal. Mm -hmm. He actually stands up for himself. Yes. Yes. So again, making different choices for very similar types of people has wildly different outcomes. Um, and you see this again with the, the next one that I want to mention, which, and this is where I, I'm, I'm going to go out on the limb a little bit here, but I, I do stand by this. I don't think Landon fully agrees, but I think that... No, I, I do agree. I don't think it's a limb. I, I think it's obvious. So so this is one where the in the Golden Trio era, it's Luna. And in the Marauders era, it's Severus. Okay, so here's the difference. Here's what happens. Severus is the weird kid. Nobody likes Severus. Nobody ever bonds with Severus. He's sort of friends with Lily, but Lily gets frustrated with him because he starts to get, you know, very um, blood purity-ist, whatever you would call that, right? And so she drops him as a friend. And he only does that because he finds other friends. Like, yes. He's trying to blend in. Yeah, he's trying to blend in. He's trying to blend in and pretend he agrees with all of this stuff that he doesn't really agree with. And he he starts kind of getting convinced into that, right? But 
Luna, that doesn't happen to her because once she realizes that she and Harry have a little bit of, of a bond, right? And, and her and Jenny have a little bit of a bond. Everyone just kind of accepts her and is nice to her. And if she wants to sit with us, that's fine. She can sit with us, right? And nobody ever makes her feel like an outsider. And she never is made to feel like she has to do things that are outside of herself to blend in the way that Severus does. Um, I also think it's it's that accept, I think what is the big change in her is the acceptance of outsiderness. Yeah. Because, so Snape comes from an abusive household that needs to blend in in mm-hmm. order to continue to be abusive. His dad is abusive to his mom. His mom is a wizard, is a witch. His dad is a muggle. Uh, and so he, and the only person who ever has accepted him in all of his life is Lily. Yeah. So he, as being in that abuse dynamic, has to blend in. Has mm-hmm. to. That's part of how you survive. Lily, Lily, uh, Luna comes from a very different background where her father, Xenophilius, is totally fine with being fucking weird. Yeah, uh, she can be a weirdo at home as much as she wants, and she can be a weird, and so she is okay with being ostracized. She's used mm-hmm. to it. Snape isn't. Snape is not comfortable with that thing, and so he starts to conform. Uh, mm-hmm. Luna never conformed. I think if Luna, I think Luna is the same personality type of like the weird one. If she did have that need to conform, uh, there would have been people who would have picked her up much sooner because that's what people who are hateful do. Is that they <laughs> people who are looking for desperation and wanting attention and, and wanting that connection. Uh, so they, they invite that into the inner circle, right? Mm-hmm. So but she doesn't have to go through that she doesn't have to go through that because she she bonds with Ginny you know and they're in the same year right and then and then Luna when we finally meet her it's because she's bonding with Harry and getting to know Harry um and uh and all of that stuff so that's you know and and so so you know she she does that and, and she has a very different outcome very different outcome than what ends up happening to Severus obviously yeah. um but same very like tro- same trophy like it's still mm-hmm. the it's the same the trope odd, of the odd friend who everyone thinks is weird yeah, so there's there's the friend that everyone thinks is gross and stupid and not as like attractive as the other boys in the group, and then there is the weird one. Like they're two mm-hmm. different ones, which is important mm-hmm. to clarify. Yep. And then the last one, um, this one is the Golden Trio version is Jenny, and the Marauders version is Lily. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about this. Uh, if you think about it. What do we actually learn about Lily throughout the books? It's just that she's friends with Severus, right? And what do we really learn about Jenny throughout the books? Just kind of that she's Luna's friend and, and Harry's love interest. And so I feel like they are connected in that way. But we don't really learn very much about either character. Well, we also learn that they have a, Lily and James have a combative relationship. Uh, Harry starts getting interested in Ginny when Ginny starts being combative towards him. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, they're both redheads. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, like, I'm gonna just, just like, it's the laziness for me. It's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yes, Ginny is Lily. Like, it is that yeah. outspoken, bright girl who uh, is different than all the other girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ginny and Lily both play that role. Yep. Um, in the in the movies, it kind of seems like Harry and Ginny's romance comes out of nowhere. It kind of comes out of nowhere oh, yeah. in the books too. It's uh, it's not really built up that much. It's you got a little bit more in the books, but not much. I'm gonna yeah. I think that with the books, you have, you at least have the entirety of the background of the books that it feels genuine. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you're like, like like her like Harry describes that as like a little monster in his chest that he mm-hmm. just starts like having wanting to be around her and doesn't know how to process that because he's an idiot. Uh, whereas in the in the movies, they they don't do anything with that internal dialogue. Yeah, well, you you because you don't have an internal monologue. You don't have an internal um, monologue in the movie. But literally then, in the books, it's literally just like he thinks Jenny's hot. Yeah, that's it. He uh, he thinks Jenny is hot and doesn't want her making out with Dean. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they and then they start making out and then they break up and then apparently they have children later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm convinced that Harry only married Jenny because he wanted to be a Weasley. What? Uh, <laughs> eat just what he always wanted. <laughs> just what he always wanted. Uh, speaking of Harry and the need to feel like he's part of a family, shall we go on to the next thing? Yes. Okay. So Jilly, uh, and I love this picture of them from the movie. It's one of my favorites. I 
hate it, and the reason I hate it is because we have to remember that Jilly was 21 when they died. You know what? We're suspending our disbelief, but you're you're right. Look anywhere close to 21. (laughs) Those people are obviously like 39 and 40. They're very cute. I love it. It's a great part of the scene. I think that this is a great photo for them to have. I can meet. I can imagine Sirius Black taking this photo and just being like, "I hate all of you." <laughs> Can't you? I can imagine that too. But I, uh, these people are not anywhere near twenty-one. Well, uh, that happens. Uh, that happens with um with all of these all of these flashbacks. Lily and James are always the actors are always much older than. Well, that uh, also, I mean, that also happens with like the fact that how old Alan Rickman is. Yeah, I mean, he was supposed to be 40 not even mm-hmm. he would have been 30 he, he was supposed he's to be like 30, early 30. yeah 30 something uh 32 or 33 when he when harry entered hogwarts yeah and alan rickman obviously is not alan rickman was not anywhere near that the even with is, that even with that uh, wig on even with that wig on alan rickman is clearly uh, minimum 50 years old in that in that uh, um movie so just like it's a little bit more tragic if we remember that they ba- ba- they barely could have drank in in uh, the United States if they mm-hmm. came. Yep, I think it's James uh, could have drank, but I'm not sure Lily could have if they made it to the U.S. before they passed away. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, so so Jilly, so we wanted to take a moment to talk about Jilly. Uh, largely because this this is a pet favorite part for Landon. So I'm gonna let her lead on this um so landon tell us everything there is to know about jilly okay so jilly is incredibly important to the story uh because a without jilly harry would not be born um but also because of what they represent to harry and um what do i mean by that i mean that harry obviously grew up without them in their lives he doesn't know anything about them until he's 11 years old and then all he is told from there on out is that he is exactly like his father and exactly like his mother and or like exactly like his mother in certain ways exactly like his father in most ways and that they were perfect and wonderful and completely amazing incredible human beings um and so if that is the foundation of the knowledge that he has and the only thing that he has ever heard he clings on to this idea of my parents were perfect uh, and that is incredibly important for his story development because what ends up happening with that is that he ends up carrying the legacy of his parents. Mm-hmm. He, he ends up carrying the legacy on his own shoulders. He puts it onto himself to carry these memories. Uh, and then not only does he put it onto himself of being like, I will be the surviving person of, of James and Lily, uh, but people who knew him, them put it on him. Mm-hmm. Uh, they put it on him by saying, you look exactly like your, your father. Every single person who knew James that came in contact with Harry tells Harry how much he looks like his father. Harry does something cool in Quidditch. It's compared to what his father did. Hermione does that with even, without even knowing who his father was. He is, he is filling these footsteps that he didn't even know existed. Uh, and so it constantly makes him feel like he's not fulfilling them because he doesn't actually get to realize that his parents were humans. Mm-hmm. Um, which well, is, I think every kid goes through that because when you're young, you think your, yeah. your parents, you think your parents are, are perfect and they're doing their, the best they possibly can. And you don't really realize till later that, oh, my parents were actually human and they screwed up a lot too. You know, no. you don't know that until later. And, and you don't even, and he doesn't get to experience it because no. they do anything to him no he never does he Um, never does he never gets to have that moment um so he carries that legacy other people put that legacy on him whether he knows it or not an example of him not knowing it is the fact that snape is putting so much and we learn later in the seventh book is putting so much on harry not only his like hate for harry's father but his love for harry's mother Mm -hmm. And, like, wanting Harry to prove that he was worth Lily's death. Like, that is things that is being projected upon Harry that Harry is taking on. So, like, it's like this invisible abuse by all the adults in Harry's life that he doesn't even know is happening. Um, And it is so tragic. It is so sad. Um, And we see it in character development a little bit. We see how Harry... um, 
really like is protective over the image of his parents. And then we see it in the fifth book, especially where when Harry learns that a James was a 15 year old asshole at one point in time, uh, who, who, who was unkind to people, uh, as most 15 year olds are, um, I will defend James Potter and anyone who calls him a terrible person because I'm like, have you been around 15 year old boys? They're all what, terrible. <laughs> what James did was not that bad. Um, <laughs> um, and that Lily and James weren't this perfect love story. That James like really annoyed Lily and Lily didn't really like James for a little while. And then eventually they fell in love. And this is like, this is earth shattering and epically changing for Harry when he learns about this. Mm -hmm. um so here in the third book why we wanted to talk about it here is because this is where the most of that like people putting pressure on him and him putting pressure on himself like sitting there and being like telling Sirius I don't think my dad would have wanted you to become a murderer like he's using his his knowledge of his father that he doesn't have because no one has told him anything other than you look like your father and remind me of your father Yep. And um, I think but for both um for both Sirius and Remus, the way they talk to him as if is it's if they're talking to their friend James, even though they are full grown adults and should not be interacting with him in that way. Um yeah. they have no they have no barrier with him the way that some of the other adults do, the way that like McGonagall does and Dumbledore does. They the the way that they speak with him and the way that they that they interact with him is very barrierless like um like irresponsibly barrierless i think remus um i i i think remus is better at it than serious oh yeah <laughs> i think he's better at it in certain aspects i think he gets better at it like in the fifth one he's really good at it good yeah at yeah it. um and he's good at recognizing that harry is a kid in the seventh one when he's like hey let's run away together let me join you let me like live out and screw my screw having a kid and like let me live out my dream of of being in the order and fighting against this um which we'll get we'll get to that whole thing uh in the seventh book that he is he is replacing harry with james Mm -hmm. um Sirius sucks at it and Mm -hmm. everyone calls out on it but everyone still continues to do it to harry yep so it's like yeah so and then the biggest example and i think oh my gosh i can't wait to reread the fifth one i think this was a movie change and it wasn't in the book um but the fact that like Sirius's last words were good one james Mm -hmm. Um, like replacing james when it's like no this is harry this is a 15 year old boy Mm -hmm. uh this is the person who's supposed to be your godfather yeah uh and i i like and we'll get into the character development of Sirius black and how much i love that for the like the character development but how much like this is sad for harry it's putting so much on him yeah uh, and this is something that i don't think the fandom talks about enough and i don't think people who like dive into the media talk about enough is that this projection of both of his parents is then like harry is is meant to hold this legacy and then live longer than both of them while also fighting a war. Mm-hmm. And and uh, it's also it's also a little bit poor serious in in this way, oh, yeah. um, because he his growth gets stunted because he's arrested so young and he's lived in Azkaban for so many years that in a lot of ways he is still a teenager. Like he says some really he says some really stupid things in this book. Once we finally get to know him a little bit, and one that that really sticks out to me is when they're walking back. They're walking back from um, from the, the confrontation with Peter Pettigrew, right? And they're floating Snape's body along with them. And Sirius is just being a big old jerk and just letting Snape just drag along and his head hitting things. And I'm like, my God. And then and then he, he turns, they're having, he's having this conversation with Harry and he basically tells Harry, oh, you saved the day. Everything's fine. I'm not going to get arrested now. And I'm thinking like, Sirius, in what world are you not going to get arrested? No one's going to believe what, what these kids say about about what happened what are you talking about yeah it and makes no sense that's the tragic thing about Sirius Black and I think we're going to yeah. dig into that a lot in two episodes from now but yeah right. he he was tortured and unable to develop mentally for 12 years which means mm-hmm. that he went in and came out a less developed 21 year old yeah uh and and then seeing the spitting image of his best friend who has died and he is and like was more than best friend was like brother to him because they've lived together for so long um that that it is it, there is an understanding of why the character would do this it is not a critique 
it is an, I'm not sitting there and saying it's not realistic. I think it's just an amazing level of depth mm-hmm. that uh, I, I wish when we talk about Harry's character, people kind of overlook. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's part of what, it's part of what makes this, this particular book so good is the way that Sirius and Harry interact and how it is very clear what Sirius has gone through has hurt him so deeply and how Harry tries to take that on. And, um, and, 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 you know, cause what else is he supposed to do? He tries to take that on and be James for Sirius because of everything that he's learned about his father so far. And why wouldn't he want to be his father? His father was wonderful at Quidditch and, and all the teachers loved him and all the other students loved him. And he, he had this, this wife that, um, that was beautiful and da 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 and all oh these things. Goodness. Like why, why wouldn't he want to be his father? Yeah. And I think it's just one other example of a way that Harry is manipulated. Yeah. It's just, even if this is not known manipulation, it is. It's still, it is still a weak point in him that can be and is used to then develop things. Yeah. 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 No, I agree with everything you're saying, Kitty. That's exactly right. So yeah, yeah. Jilly, Jilly, uh, the way that it's presented in the store, in the book, and at this point is it's this perfect love story. So why wouldn't he want it? Yeah. And, and I think, and like, like I said, we're, we're introduced to them as a couple for the first time in this book. We're really getting some in-depth on it. Uh, the fifth book is where Harry's perspective of everything changes, um, mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily change the dynamic. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. So, um, and if you want to talk about happy Jilly stuff, I will do that any day of the week. Catch me on Discord. Uh, but this is where the, like, the, the fallout of Jilly being what it is affects yeah. Harry so much. Yep tragedy okay so we have this we have this segment every time we have realized we we're, we are to our spot the problem segment for this book and um we're going to talk <laughs> about the werewolves and aids so the werewolves according to jk rowling werewolves as they are presented in harry potter are supposed to be a motif for the AIDS crisis. So what what the AIDS crisis was, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I mean, we all know this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm just gonna say it. Um, basically what happened is we, we had this autoimmune disease, right, that spread throughout our LGBT community, that spread throughout our um, communities of color in the US. And we decided that because it wasn't the rich white cis people getting AIDS, we didn't give a fuck. And so we let them die and we didn't have to, but we did. Um, and that was something that happened in, in the US. I assume something very similar happened in the UK. Of course, um, I, I don't live there. I don't know the history, but that's what we did here in this country. It was more and, prevalent in the United States. Just because yeah, of the way very prevalent, very prevalent. So, <laughs> so, so JK Rowling creates this werewolf character, Remus Lupin. And, and he, he is a werewolf. He's trying very much to control his werewolf side of him. He's, he's a teacher and he's doing all these things to prove like, no, I'm not, it's not dangerous. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for the prime subscription, Luna. I really appreciate that. Um, so, so Remus Lupin is this character that is, that is trying his hardest to rise above the stigma of being a werewolf where, you know, it's it's in the similar way that, that, a that a person living with AIDS might have done a lot of things to try to rise above the stigma of them having AIDS, right? And and there was at the time, and there still is a lot of uh, of ideas about, you know, we shouldn't have gay people around the children or we shouldn't have trans people around the children because of this, that, or the other. And back when the AIDS crisis was going on, AIDS was used as, as a reason for this. We don't want our kids to catch HIV. We don't want our kids to develop AIDS, okay? But here's the thing. <laughs> you're not going to catch HIV from sitting next to someone with HIV. So this is really a non problem. We just created this problem because we, we like to other people we don't understand. Right? So y'all, y'all know all of this. Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem with werewolves being the metaphor for AIDS in the world of Harry Potter. AIDS isn't pretend dangerous to children. It is truly dangerous to children. When a werewolf transforms into their wolf, if they do not, you know, do all of the crazy things that Remus tries to go through, they really do lose themselves and kill people. They really truly do. It's not like, it's, it, it's not like the, the AIDS crisis. So unfortunately, 
What this means is that in the wizarding world, if werewolves are aids and werewolves function in a way that truly is dangerous to the wizards, then what the book's saying is that aids is actually dangerous to to be around. You know, that actually you can't have a friend with aids because you might die. And I don't think that was what J.K. Rowling meant to say, but that's what she said. That, that this is reality, This it does not just exist in a bigot's imagination that this is dangerous, it is truly dangerous. And wow, yikes. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in there are so many other layers on top of it. That is the surface level. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, no, it is, but it's that thing of being like, yeah, if, if there is a difference. You have if you're going to make a metaphor for one thing or a uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Allegory. Uh, an allegory, yeah. If you're gonna make an allegory for one thing or the other. They have to be, they have to be equal. Well, when it, you make an allegory, what you're doing is you're purposefully commenting on the thing you're allegorizing. Yes. Right. But I don't think that's why I don't necessarily think that J.K. Rowling went into this with I'm gonna write an AIDS metaphor. I think yeah. she went into this and later realized, oh, this could kind of be an AIDS metaphor, and then she just said that in an interview because if you actually look at it, the text of an allegory, then her comment on AIDS means AIDS is dangerous and people with AIDS shouldn't be around kids. That's what yeah. she's saying. She's like, well, like she's trying to bring attention to the fact that Remus couldn't have a job. Well, Remus ends up leaving the position anyway. Like she's sitting mm -hmm. there and being like, oh, the, the bringing the attention is to the fact that Remus was a werewolf and couldn't have a job, but he doesn't have a job at Hogwarts at the end of the book anyway. And he still struggles mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the series to find financial help. And also uh, her, their, their future, his future partner and child are stigmatized because of his, his disease and, mm -hmm. um, and everything like that too. So you're absolutely right. Like there isn't an allegory attached to this. There yeah, is a yeah. metaphor, there is a, like, this stands for it, but it has no direct belief of what, of what JKR says, except for the fact that be, having AIDS is dangerous. Well, that's basically what it's saying, because because Remus ends ends his um, tenure at Hogwarts basically saying, well, I have to leave now because um, now that, you know, it's a little bit more public, that people are, it's in the news again that I'm a werewolf, um, I have to leave because parents are going to be breathing down Dumbledore's neck, you know, they're, they're very, they're concerned. But the thing is, in this world, the parents aren't being dumb. They have a right to be concerned. They do. Like, werewolves are truly dangerous. Uh, yes, they are truly dangerous, and, um, even though there are, like, in the canon written ways of, of, like, combating that danger, we just saw the exact scenario of worst case scenario. Yeah. Like, less than, less than a chapter since then. Where right. this doesn't take his potion on time and goes full out crazy that he's willing to murder his dearest friend. Yeah. Uh, and, and it is, it's, yeah, it's gross. <laughs> It's really gross. It's really, really gross. And and I just think it's it's one of those things that like um that I just wish JK Rowling would stop editorializing Harry Potter because okay, so you can take it farther. If um if the if the werewolf, if being a werewolf is a metaphor for AIDS and, and werewolves are supposed to be like, you know, gay people who had AIDS back at the time of the AIDS crisis, who's our other prominent werewolf character? It is Fenrir Greyback. And what, what's Fenrir Greyback's favorite thing well, to do? Go infect children with being a werewolf. That's his favorite thing to do. It's what he lives for. And it's like, what? So are you saying that gay people actively are going after children? We only have two examples of werewolves. And, and, and one of them is, liter is, is like the, the Harry Potter version of a child molester. It's yeah. crazy. Well, and then on top of that, the other version so remus so we have the you know a child killer child molester with fenrir grayback and then with uh oh my god what was i gonna say sorry with remus he's also the only there is a so not only with the aids metaphor is there hinted towards queerness with with uh this character but just how he acts what he says he is queer coded in a lot of ways yeah. Well, even uh, and even the actor says that that they were recommended to play him gay. 
it wasn't J.K. Rowling who said to play him gay, but the director did. So actually, mm-hmm. the actor originally thought that this character was gay mm-hmm. and played him that way. That's what he was told. And and was and got inspiration from the re- like from the from the source character. So there is it wasn't out of nowhere where they were like, hey, let's make Remus gay for the for the movie. It was he was told to play basically a gay addict, mm-hmm. um, and, and with AIDS. <laughs> um, and and so you, the only other representation that we have of of possible like coded queerness is also then monster. Mm-hmm. So it's not even just AIDS and AIDS being in this thing is dangerous, but also if you're gay, you're a monster. Yeah, uh, and you're a monster who attacks children. Yeah. And you're either a monster who attacks children who can't help it and is trying to do everything to stop it, like Remus Lupin, or you're a monster who attacks children who loves it, like Frederick. Yeah. And it's just, it's so tragic. It's so tragic because we get these interviews where it's like, well, you know, there, there isn't really um, LGBT discrimination in the wizarding world. Okay, then where are all the gay wizards? Where yeah. are they? Uh, in the biggest mind, there aren't anybody, there aren't any gay wizards. Uh, <laughs> it just it blows my mind it just blows my mind and this is the one this is the one it can an example that of supposed queerness and and this is what we get and then we also get that this character is then written as straight uh because yeah. i mean they're because they're not because in the books they're not they're not actually they're not actually queer they were in the they were they were a gay man in the mind of the actor who was playing them and of, and of course you know wolf star we all we love wolf star and the, so the, for, for the fandom but in the canon it, it's he's not and there is enough there is enough coding that yeah is not but then come later books he is then decided that the only other female who is not in a relationship and then they're gonna up, pair him with tonks uh and then they have a baby uh-huh. uh you know also maybe Remus is bisexual he's not he is not statedly bisexual but we can't erase that uh yeah. just because you marry a woman doesn't doesn't mean your your uh, sexual identity is is anything less than valid I mean, you know, I ch- I choose I choose to believe in bisexual Remus because I mean I I enjoy the the Tonks and Remus storyline. There's some problems with it. I know it doesn't hit for everybody, but um, but I enjoyed that storyline, and I also very much enjoy a good Wolf Star fix. So, um, I am I am all here for bisexual Remus Lupin. Um, but it is it is that issue of that the only real representation of of queerness is is a monster, uh, and then also has the AIDS allegory the very poor AIDS allegory on top of it so just really tragic Uh, it's it's gross um and it it is one of I think when we think of uh J.K. Rowling's problems not going book by book it is the biggest one that comes to mind yeah it's it's so it's kind of it's it's interesting because uh spoilers we usually have two or three problems. Guess what? This is the only one this time. Uh, this mm-hmm. book is so good. This book is so good um, uh, that uh, that it's really just this. But I, I do agree that this is probably the biggest one of the series. The only one that I think comes even close is House Elves Like to Be Slaves, actually. I mean, that's the only other one that comes even close to being like such, an, like such a big deal. Um, but yeah, I think this is one of the one of the most glaring issues, and and it comes not only from the text itself, but it also comes from J.K. Rowling's inability to stop freaking editorializing and answering interview questions that we don't really want the answer for. We know now we don't really want the answer for these things. Uh, this one was said pretty early on, though. I, yeah, I, it was. I mean, at that point, we didn't know either, and at that point, like I, yeah, she, she just, probably didn't know either. She didn't know either. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's on surface, like this idea of, oh, I wanted to bring attention to the fact that people with AIDS don't get jobs, that they're discriminated against, that especially in the 90s, when this book takes place, that's what was happening and was relevant because the AIDS pe- epidemic was happening in the, ni- it was happening in the 80s and 90s, um, or sorry, 70s and 80s. So uh, was happening, pro- was very mm-hmm. prevalent during this time. Um, but... <sighs> And also, like, because there was this idea that things like AIDS could be cured in the wizarding world. So that you had to have a disease that wasn't curable and let's bring in werewolves to have that and lycanthropy. And it just, it's like, no, that's not what you said. <laughs> Whether you and it's, said, and it's, and, it's, and, it's <laughs> and it's mostly because we just don't, we just, we only meet two 
werewolf characters ever that we know their motivations and that we know you know anything about how they feel or think or anything we only meet the two and because you've only got those two examples it it's very it becomes very bigoted and there's no outcome with it like that's yeah. the other thing too is that the the, the outcome of remus lupin is terrible mm-hmm. he gets he resigns from hogwarts even though he is the only qualified teacher other than mcgonagall and, okay so he's like the only qualified teacher that they've really had in defense against the dark arts and <laughs> will ever have in defense against the dark arts by the way but i'm um, uh, <laughs> spoiler, spoiler alert um and so you have that issue and so he resigns from this he then when the war starts gets a job where he has to then be underground and live with werewolves and the people yeah that he, because he also by the way part of this is that he also has to be self-punishing uh because he has to hate the fact that he's a werewolf he right werewolf is nasa ism because he has to view that his lycanthropy is an issue just like having aids is a dirty thing Mm -hmm. um lycanthropy is a dirty thing which is not true if you have aids you have aids if you have lycanthropy then you should just have lycanthropy in this yeah it should it should function the same way any other disease does you know uh but aids i mean was very different and didn't um it still doesn't unfortunately um even though hiv is uh is but it's very man it's very manageable nowadays you would never know it you would never know if somebody had it unless they told you nowadays not at all very very manageable Uh, but again, like that, that doesn't transfer through is that he has to be the self-punishing yeah. person. Very uh, sad. And that's really, first of all, ableist, like really gross. Um, but also just speaks to that level of, well, you view this as a bad thing. Yeah. And people who live with this shouldn't view it as a bad thing. Yeah. Both view it as a bad thing. But that's it. That's the only thing in this book that we really um, have an issue with, which is, uh, you know, only one really thing, impressive. even though it's a big thing, but that's pretty impressive, right? It, it really shows that this book had a lot of love from the editors and a lot of help and probably <laughs> multi- lots and lots more drafts than the first two. Um, so, yeah. And and the there are definitely problems that will continue happening. Um, but I mean, and we also have to recognize that the problems from before still exist here. So, oh, yeah. Like, they didn't go away (laughs) here uh there isn't as much slavery happening in this one but we'll make it up for the next one yeah don't worry it's coming back you guys (laughs) um yeah so this one this one is a big one Mm -hmm. um all right final thoughts Okay, so, you know, we love to ask at the end of each of these episodes where we talk about a a piece of media is um, we don't like to say if something is objectively good or bad. What we like to say instead is, did it resonate? So, um, Landon, did The Prisoner of Azkaban resonate with you and does it still resonate with you? Fuck yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Same. Yes. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it resonated with me as far as it being like the kind of, like, finally we're rereading a book that I actually like. Um, I struggle very hard with the first and second book. Uh, and we're rereading that. The actual literature and writing is really good, which resonates. And then the character developments that are happening and the storylines are interesting. Okay. Um, I mean, I agree with all of it. I agree with all of it. It resonated I, with me then. It still resonates with me now. It's beautiful. I'm becoming more and more excited because I feel like the final books resonate more and more, especially when we start getting into the, uh, you know, character versus society um mm-hmm. the society cl- like conflicts that are going to happen in the fifth sixth and seventh book but uh i i do love this one yeah this is probably this is this is the one the book that probably brings me the most pure joy because we've not gotten to the societal implications quite yet so i don't have to really think about that too hard but i've still got all of these really um juicy tropes that i love and i love the 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 character development in this book and um and you know despite what uh what problems remus poses for the themes of this book he is one of my favorite characters so uh that's another reason that i really love this book we got a lot of remus in this book and uh, and and you know he's very near and dear to my heart and you know what guys also i also have a fascination with um with peter pettigrew and this is where we really get to understand him the most in this book so um yes uh it's wonderful it's definitely one of my favorites uh, I, it might be my my all time favorite as far as all the Harry Potter books go, but I we need to finish the reread before I say that for sure. Uh, but uh, but this one this one has a very um, special place in my heart. Yeah, I think that this is the lightest book that's fun to read. 
Yeah. Uh, it is an easy read for me because you're right. It doesn't have that implications of society. Uh, it's like it's like slipping on an old cardigan. Like yeah. it just it's comfortable. It's, it's a nice, comfortable story. Yeah. Uh, nothing is too emotionally harrowing. Uh, no one dies in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I am in for a world of pain as we continue on. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I want to continue on. Um, there is, it's nice to look back and see like certain tragedies that are happening, like the whole Harry and, and his family thing. But uh, slowly but surely, it's a really, it's a really good book. Yeah, it's good. Tis resonates right. a lot. <laughs> yep. So, so the next, um, the next Harry Potter book that we're going to cover for those of you guys keeping up will not be until January. So we'll get to the fourth book in January. It, those start to get longer. So um, we've been doing about a Harry Potter book every other month. I don't know if we're going to be able to keep up with that because as you guys know, I'm a relatively slow reader. So I wanted to make sure I had the Christmas break available to read um, the uh, the next Harry Potter book. So we'll see if we continue our every other month exactly. We might adjust it a little bit. But that's when the next Harry Potter book is going to be. And next month, actually, what we are going to be doing is... Um, Landon is in the process of watching her uh, very first uh, anime, guys. So we are going to be talking about Cowboy Bebop next month for our next media episode. I will let you guys know when that gets closer, exactly when it's going to be. But that is going to be our next media episode, Cowboy Bebop. So for you guys keeping up, you are welcome to um, watch Cowboy Bebop along with us. Uh, I wanted I, I wanted to rewatch the animated one anyway because the live action one is coming out. And, um, and again, Landon hasn't watched a lot of anime before. She only really ever watched Sailor Moon. So um, this will be the first uh, anime that she's watched outside of Ghibli movies and Sailor Moon. Yes, it'll be. It's, I am excited. Um, I, I, have, I have learned through this process of getting ready to watch this that I have, I do not have a correct understanding of what anime is. Um, <laughs> anime, I think of Sailor Moon, which has like 14 seasons and seven movies and I'm just like I'm an adult woman who does not have that kind of time anymore <laughs> um, uh, so I'm very excited also cartoons are hard but so far I um, I'm enjoying it so you'll get my more thought out thoughts on that next month yep um, yep but next week on interstage window we are going to be playing don't starve together so we're gonna do an episode of that we're gonna have um our spooky halloween episode next weekend and it is a, a community stream which means you can expect to see some of the cast members there um I, kitty i think you're you're joining us correct me if i'm wrong i think also um brie might be joining us unsure on that kendra might be joining us lunar okay yes lunar you should definitely join us um the way that we're setting this up is the same way that we set up our stardew stream so because this is kind of spooky stardew right so what you want to do if you want to be a part of this um, is make sure you're in the Discord server, which I'm going to pop a link if I could type. Okay, so pop, go and get in there and make sure you have the farmer role. If you have the farmer role, you're going to get everything you need to know for next week's um, Don't Starve Together stream. I've only played this game once. It was during the first um, 100 follower stream party, and I don't feel like I really learned it very well. So um, I don't really know what I'm doing. So we'll see if we survive or if we don't survive. <laughs> before halloween we won't survive but we'll have yeah. fun dying so <laughs> yes <laughs> and then um on thursday we're going to do the second part of my doki doki literature club blind playthrough i've never played this game before we played it on thursday it started to get a little bit weird and creepy but supposedly it gets absolutely bonkers um but i've never played it before so i don't really know for sure i, I totally missed it when it was popular so um i hear it gets worse and it gets crazy uh there was a big content warning when I first started that game. So for if you're not familiar with it, just, just know there was a giant content warning. So I can only expect we have not actually gotten as bonkers as it's going to get because we've seen nothing that warrants the level of content warning it had at the beginning of that game. But if you want to watch that, that's going to be on Thursday. Because I am at my parents' house right now, and I'm in central time, so the times are a little bit different, but pay attention to what I put on Twitter and what I put in the Discord for exactly when that stream's going to happen, but it is going to be on Thursday um, coming up. And then, of course, you know, you can find me on YouTube and all my socials. Here's all here's all my things. So that's all That's all my plugs. Landon, um, where can everybody find you? What would you like to plug today? You can find me at Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Land in Maine. It's a pun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm posting thirst traps. 
on TikTok. I'm posting hot takes on Twitter and I'm posting beautiful fall colors on Instagram. So Ooh. there is content, content, content everywhere. And I love all those things. I know, it's so <laughs> fun. Um, I am also just existing. So if you want to buy something off my Amazon wish list, please do. Uh, and yeah, that's that's all I'm going to say. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, so spooky, spooky Halloween fun coming up, guys. Um, follow Landon on all of her things. Um, her TikTok's really good, even though I deleted TikTok. Sometimes I will still go to her TikTok just on the computer so I can see hers. <laughs> I their shops are spicy. It got so. dangerous for me. It got dangerous for me. You know, I was spending way too much time on TikTok, so I had to delete it. <laughs> I am also spending way too much time on TikTok and yet don't have the self-control to stop. So it's fun. Um. Thank you for the applause, Kitty. Thank you for the applause. So that's two applauses um, for this week. Landon is Landon is well fed. She's gonna live real good this coming up week. Oh shoot, three applauses. Oh my god. Thank you. I deserve this. Um. <laughs> All right, guys. That's it. That's our show. Um, let's find somebody to raid. All right. So it looks like um, Ingzi is playing Valorant. And it looks like he could use a little few more viewers. Looks like he just got started. So we're going to raid into um, Ingzi's stream today. Uh, I'll make sure I know how to spell his name. I do not know how to spell his name. Give me one second, guys. Spooky, spooky, spooky time. I, that song mm -hmm. is stuck in my head. I don't even think that's the words. I, the by spooky, the way, scary skeletons? That's the one! Yeah, spooky, scary skeletons. <laughs> next week, but spooky week is next week. And mm -hmm. spooky it's just a week to enjoy spookiness. So that's right. Go out and do something spooky. Yes. I'm with my class, uh, the Telltale Heart. So I will be responsible for children's nightmares. Um, and I'm very looking forward to it. Oh my gosh. I'm, I, I'm so jealous of your kids getting to read that for the first time. So that's fun. amazing. So <laughs> All right, guys, here we go. Let's go ahead and read into Ingzi. Um, of course, you guys, as always, I will see you later. And don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. All right, guys, here we go. In three, two, one, let's raid. Bye.